2022 with this brand new board that you will have for at least the next two years. We welcome our new board members. Uh, cannot wait to serve with you. We will begin uh, with a pledge of allegiance because we have established a quorum. I believe we have two MNPS students, Atticus and Theodore Elrod. Would you please come to the front and lead us in the pledge? Uh, community, would you please rise for the pledge? <laughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was cute. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mr. Elrod. <laughs> all right, it is the time we have all been waiting on. It has certainly been a pleasure to serve this board, this director, and this community as board chair. I am not going to cry, but I have grown personally and professionally in ways that I did not expect to and sometimes didn't want to. So thank you for allowing me to serve in that capacity. But it is time to elect a new board chairperson and a new board vice chairperson. Mrs. Elrod, it has been a pleasure to serve with you. Dr. Battle, you as well. Thank you all for, for pushing me and helping uh, me to help guide this district. But with that, I will begin by accepting nominations for board chairperson. Mrs. Masters? Uh, I nominate Rachel Ann Elrod. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. second? second. We have plenty of seconds. Any discussion? All right. All in favor on a new board chairperson, Mrs. Rachel Ann Elrod, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Mrs. Elrod. But with a vice chairman role open, we will now accept uh, nominations for the vice chairman role. Uh, Dr. Berthina Nabal McKinney. I make a motion for Frida Player to be vice chair. All right, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor for Mrs. Frida Player to become our next vice chairperson, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, new board leadership. We are here to support you. If you will give us just a moment, we will do a changing of the guard. Tennessee legislative representative. I, my apologies, we do have just one more uh, leadership role. We have a Tennessee legislator representative. Le representative that will act as a bit of a liaison. We have a lot of work to do with this legislature. So I will accept nominations for a Tennessee legislator, legislative representative. Um, I nominate Ms. Emily Masters for the Tennessee legislative representative. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Do we have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, please raise your hand for Mrs. Masters. Motion passes un almost unanimously. Yeah. <laughs> unanimously. Uh, Mrs. Masters, I believe you'll be working a bit more closely with Dr. Sevier as you have already been doing. And then when we have a um, legislative liaison, that will likely be, you will be our point person. Thank you three for serving in this role. We will now shift seats. Mrs. Elrod, please take your place. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Take your umbrella with you as your parting gift. <laughs> Excuse me while I move the words. I, I used to type my notes and now I, I used to write my notes, excuse me, now I type them. Um, before we continue with the agenda, I do have a, a couple words. So first, thank you to Ms. Bugs and thank you to my colleagues for their votes of support. Um, I am deeply honored uh, to hold this position and very excited about it. I am especially humbled to have everyone's support. That is so nice. So uh, yes, before we move on with the agenda, let me have these few thoughts. Um, half of us stood up for election on August the 4th, and I believe that tonight's vote is a continuation of what we loudly heard from Nashville's voters and our constituents and that the city wants a school board that works together even when it's tough uh, to move the ball forward to make each MMPS school a place where Nashville's children can receive a high quality equitable education that honors their humanity and prepares them to reach their full potential. Um, as a board, we have a tremendous responsibility for that, both individually and collectively, and we need to work with that goal in mind, and I look forward to us all doing so. That is especially true, as some at the state, and even within our own city, have worked to remove or replace our elected school leadership and or overturn our responsibilities that are ours as an elected responsible. 
or it is a responsible elected person, excuse me. Yet our elected school board and its wide breadth of work is vital to a public school system. And I am so proud of the one that I represent. It has been my privilege to serve with Chair Bugs um, the past two years as vice chair. And together we have proven, together, but a lot of Christian, one, again, we have all grown so much. Together we have <laughs> proven that transparency, advocacy, reliability, expertise, and professionalism on the board invokes confidence and trust from our city, our families, our industries, and our community partners. This approach has helped lead MMPS to obtain more resources, make our teachers the highest paid, our staff have received uh, raises, we've had uh, long needed capital gains um, increase as well, and we have also have improved academic outcomes, which we're hearing from and hearing about tonight, and I'm, I love seeing this full room. But as my colleagues and I start our terms tonight, I want to be sure to point out that we are a woman-led MMPS Board of Education, and like our school system, <laughs> yes. And as, just like our school system, we have a majority of minority members. And I think that's important as well that we represent the people that we serve. Both of these things, thank you. Of course, it's Miss Linda. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, both of these things are not only unique to the state of Tennessee, but also across the country. Our director of schools, our past chair, myself, we're all under the age of 40, and we all have children actively in the schools. Um, we all on the board have busy family lives and professional lives, yet we have committed to public service to leave our city better than we found it and to propel it forward with its future workforce, communities, and citizens in mind. It is our honor to be our city, our city citizens that have elected to lead the schools and have trusted us, um, our neighbors have trusted us, excuse me, to be dedicated, ambitious, and discerning in this role. And it is my honor to serve with each of you as the true critical friends of Metro National Public Schools. I am so proud to work with you. I know we have an incredible impact and so much work to do, and I have a number of things I'm sure you're so surprised by that I would like to implement, and some will even <laughs> happen this week, because you know how I am. <laughs> and so I will be contacting a bunch of y'all this week about some things coming up and trying to prepare board retreats, and I look forward to all of it. And um, for our community at large and for so many of our staff that are here in the room, I vow to have improved in communication and to focus on those. So to focus on improved communication, visibility, advocacy. Oh, hey. 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 Look, at yeah. Look at that shirt. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> to have a focus on improved communications, visibility, advocacy, oversight, transparency, leadership, and professionalism. I appreciate that you've listened to these words. Um, I am so, again, honored by your votes. I, I'm going to trust that I had Dr. Gentries as well with her incredible shirt. Um, and I appreciate it. Now, so on to that, let's have tonight's agenda. So first, I would like to see a motion to either adopt or amend the agenda as it's listed. I move to the to adopt the agenda. We have a second. Second. Thank you. All right. You should have Sharon read our shirt. Well, we will probably get announcements. Oh. <laughs> All right. The adoption of the agenda has been first and seconded. All in approval on the adoption of our agenda. Please raise your hand. Thank you. That's unanimous. Nope. Cheryl, did you raise your hand? Oh, you did. Okay, thank you. And so we will begin our evening with awards and recognitions. Dr. Battle. All right. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, first to um, Ms. Bugs, thank you so much um, for the last few years in your leadership serving as chair. Congratulations to you, uh, Madam Chair Rachel Ann Elrod, um, serving as vice chair. We've already been working so closely together, so I'm looking forward to our continued partnership um, and collaboration. And also congratulations to you, Vice Chair uh, Frida Player. Um, as budget chair, we've had lots and lots of advocacy conversations, so um, I look forward to our conversations and planning in your new role. Um, and to all of our other board members, welcome. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, a great discussion this evening and celebrating um, many of our leaders who are with us tonight. Um, so tonight we have the pleasure of celebrating and honoring our schools for what they achieved in the 2021-22 school year on the state's accountability matrix. Before I jump into this, I want to remind you just 
this a few weeks and months ago. Um, you heard me talk about just how challenging um, the 21-22 school year was as we were transitioning back into the in-person learning environment and kind of learning our way, but with the commitment, Ebenezer, to be better than normal. Um, <laughs> and so I just want to kind of set that context before we start um, our recognitions tonight. So first, MPS as a whole has been designated an advancing school district by the Tennessee Department of Education based on our 21-22 TCAP results. <laughs> the second highest rating a district can achieve in the state's accountability model. Now I want to be clear, everyone played a part in this achievement. We must recognize our students, our teachers, our support staff, our principals, this board, our parents, the community, everyone um, who really helped keep the focus on our students where it needs to be and where it needs to continue to be. So we did this all together. Um, that's what's most important and we did it in some very trying circumstances as we got, again, everyone back in the in-person learning environment, actually for the first time since the 2020 school year. So let's just pause for a moment and give everyone a round of applause for a year of academic growth and achievement. Now, while I'm so proud of all the work of all of our learning uh, communities, and we know that we're on a journey of continuous improvement, I want to take an opportunity to um, recognize the individual accomplishments um, of um, 34 of our schools. Um, we have 34 district-run schools that achieved reward status, which is a record number in this district, including two that were previously on the priority schools list. That that deserves a round of applause. We also have another four schools that also exited priority school status. Let's give it up for them as well. Tremendous work um, all across the board, and I'm honored to work alongside every leader, and especially these leaders who are improving outcomes for our students. So reward schools are the best of the best in the state of Tennessee after scoring in the top tiers of the state's accountability metrics. Now, this is not just about growth. It factors in TCAP achievement scores, growth scores, chronic absence, English learner proficiency, graduation rates, and ready graduate metrics, depending on the grade tier of the school. And not only only do we have a tremendous number of schools performing at the top level, but for the first time ever, MMPS has fewer priority schools than the last time the list was run. Y'all, we're going to clap a lot tonight. We have to make sure this is hard, complex work, and we've got to celebrate the successes of our students and our school com communities. Moving out of priority status is a major achievement that these principals can be proud of. But most importantly, it means better results for our students. Principals who are here, as I call your school's name, please come up proudly. Mm -hmm. Come up near the podium and then we'll gather for some photos up here in the front of the board table, but we want to individually recognize you and your school communities. First, I want to recognize four of the schools that exited priority school status. When I call your name, please come on up. Alex Green Elementary. <laughs> to the podium. Okay. Cumberland Elementary. Woo! McMurray Middle School. Woo! And Robert Churchwell Elementary. principals, if you can come up this way through the little gate, we're going to take a quick picture of you. It's going to be quick. Yes, it's going to be I quick. Okay, you got three schools. See. <laughs> <laughs> and board members who represent these schools, please join us. Well, church will is mine now. So. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so congratulations to each of these schools and thank you for everything you're doing every day on behalf of students. And I can just attest that everything is in service to our students. Now we also have two schools that have not only exited priority status, but also jumped all the way to the top, y'all, to reward status, which is not seen very often. This reflects great focus, intentionality, leadership, teamwork on the part of everyone at these two schools um, on behalf of their students. So I would like to recognize at this time two of our fabulous schools that exited priority status and entered reward school status. They are Amqui Elementary School. Warner Elementary School. Principal Gibbs, y'all have to stay there for a moment, right? All right, you get two recognition, so you got to stay there. Um, as we call up and acknowledge all of our other reward schools today, and then we'll take a big photo. Um, so along with Amqui and Warner, I'm also thrilled to recognize 32 more schools for being named reward schools for the 21-22 school year. Again, these schools are among the best of the best in the state of Tennessee based on their student outcomes, and it's an extremely impressive achievement for each one of them. And I will also share that in this, the multiple conversations I've had, they've all said, and this is not the end, it is only the beginning um, of the outcomes that we will achieve for our students. So, let's get this started um, with Charlotte Park Elementary School. <laughs> Elementary. Free Paul Elementary. There you go, Nate. <laughs> Dan Mills Elementary. Dotson Elementary. Aiken Elementary. Woo! Early College High School. Y'all yeah. shake out your hands for just a moment. <laughs> I guess we got a ways to go. Fall Hamilton Elementary. Woo! Glendale Elementary. Gary Elementary. Brian Barry Elementary. Tropic Valley Elementary. Head Middle. Hume Falls High School. Isaac Litton Middle. <laughs> J.E. Moss Elementary. <laughs> All right, I know we still got good energy. Jolton Elementary. <laughs> John B. Whitsitt Elementary. J.T. Moore Middle. <laughs> Julia Green Elementary. <laughs> Lakeview Elementary. <laughs> Cla 
Lachlan Elementary. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. High School. Shane Elementary. <laughs> Meg's Middle. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Neely's Bend Elementary. <laughs> Old Center Elementary. <laughs> Percy Priest Elementary. <laughs> Rose Park Middle. <laughs> Sylvan Park Elementary. <laughs> Una Elementary. <laughs> and the West End Middle. <laughs> Everyone, I think they deserve a standing ovation. All right, we need to grab a uh, big, <laughs> a big reward school photo. So if you all can come up front, board members, if you can join us, we'll snap a quick picture and allow these leaders to keep leading. So we might just stand in our seat. You all are the heroes. You don't show me. Cheerleaders here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now listen, I'm going to show up on Friday for your celebration. <laughs> That's right. I need to get a cabbage I need to come off script for just a moment. I love it. All right, so I'm coming off script just a little bit. If we have any teachers or staff that represents any of the 34 schools that were just represented, can we get you to the front for a quick picture? Yeah. Any staff members, teachers?
we have a staff member here, a leader, please come and join us for the picture. What you're presenting is what? This is the one Kimi my kids always give me on Halloween because they know how to do it. So, so much. All right, ladies, y'all ready with the spare fingers again? Let's do it. Go teacher, go staff, go <laughs> So congratulations again to all the schools that exited priority status, entered into reward status, our two that moved from priority to reward for every school community, for every teacher, team, uh, support member. If you're part of Team MPS, parents, everyone, this entire community, thank you because a level five district and achieving di district does not happen, advancing district does not happen by chance. It happens by design and we appreciate all of your support um, and your focus um, as we're in relentless pursuit of making sure that every MMPS student is known. So thank you again and Madam Chair, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Do you want to do the director's report now? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's do the director's report then. <coughs> All right, so um, we're gonna move directly into our director's report. Um, lots of celebrations again of the successes of our students um, as a result of the hard work of our fabulous team. Uh, we also know that there's still a lot of work to be done and we're committing and recommitting every day um, to make sure that our students have what they deserve. And so our work will continue. This is only the beginning for Metro National Public Schools. Uh, we expect that to be in this space year after year to ensure that every student um, is where they need to be and where their talents um, are sure to take them. We want to make sure we're supporting them on that journey towards success. Again, congratulations, um, Chair, Vice Chair. Uh, welcome back, um, Board Member uh, Mays and Berthina Nabamakini. Welcome, uh, Board Member O'Hara Block. Um, it is so good to be with you and um, engaging in our first director's uh, report this evening. Um, all board members, again, it's so good to see you. Um, so now before we get into our presentation in just a moment around accountability, because we, again, we just did a lot of celebrating. We have our commitment to where we are and where we need to be. We want to dig a little bit into what this accountability means. Um, how did we arrive at, at being an advancing district? How did these schools arrive at advancing? And what is it going to take to continue to reduce the number of priority schools um, that we have? Um, before I jump in, I do want to give a quick um, COVID update. Um, to the board. Last week we had um, 77 students who were confirmed positive, which is down from 176 the week before and 422 the week before that. The number of staff cases was at 37 last week. That number was 38 the week before and 110 before that. So the trend lines have been moving in the right direction in terms of cases in schools and like always, we'll continue to um, update and provide information um, as necessary. But it brings me um, great honor um, and pleasure to um, ask a few of our leaders to um, 
approach the podium to walk us through the accountability um, data that, again, we've been communicating and celebrating. Um, Paul Changis, um, Tina Stinson, as they're coming up, I just want to take another opportunity to um, thank Paul um, for all of his leadership and, and work um, in the accountability assessment, the research space. Um, for many, many years, um, Paul has stood with us, beside us, um, delivering you know, news that wasn't always as positive as what we're celebrating um, today. And you know, he and I have talked as he has retired, but then kind of came back to help us. Um, that you know, this is this is what it's all about. Uh, Paul has been pushing to make sure that um, the needle is moving in the right direction for MMPS um, students. In fact, it's just been a dream come true to work so closely with him and digging into the data. And quite frankly, sometimes we just need to listen to Paul, right? Um, because he he can see and tell um, um, what's happening, and it just brings me great pleasure, Paul, to have you here with us um, this evening to share this accountability update um, in your uh, last year in official role as Executive Officer of Research Assessment and Evaluation um, in Metro Nashville Public Schools. So let me say congratulations to you. Um, thank you for all your leadership and direction um, and support you've provided to myself, my cabinet, the principals, um, the leaders all across this district to get to where we are today. And also welcome to Tina, um, who will um, be transitioning who has transitioned into um, our Director of Research Assessment and Evaluation. You all are a dynamic duo, a great team, um, and I just could not be more thankful for um, the, the wisdom and the expertise that you have provided to this district. So um, y'all help me welcome Paul Changis and Tina Stinson to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Chair Elrod and members of the board, I'm not sure I can live up to that introduction, but I will uh, be happy uh, to lead off the presentation and then hand it over to Dr. Stinson, who uh, is the real expert on state accountability and has been my right hand for many years. Uh, this is my 25th year of reporting assessment or accountability data to the district, and uh, I'll be honest, uh, some years have been easier than others. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about good news that we have. Uh, it may be a, a little anticlimactic after the rewards uh, <laughs> ceremony we had, but uh, we're going to dig into the, the state accountability system a little bit, and uh, hopefully by the end of the session, uh, you'll know a little bit more about how these uh, accountability systems work and the measures that go into them. And I'll say right up front, it uh, is a rather complex accountability system. Uh, but the good news, and, and you can't do an overview without getting into the weeds a little bit, but uh, we will try to keep it uh, uh, from going too deep into those weeds. Uh, one thing you will come away with is the idea that it really is based on multiple measures, though, and, and that's a good thing. We don't want uh, to be held accountable just based on one test or one set of measures. Uh, as Dr. Battle uh, has uh, announced previously, uh, the district moved into advancing status uh, this year, the second of the, the five categories that the state assigns to districts. Uh, this is based on an overall score across multiple measures, and we'll go into those measures in just a minute. Uh, this is the latest of a series of good news that uh, we've been able to share this year in terms of how our students are bouncing back since the start of the pandemic. Uh, as you probably remember, uh, we did quite well in terms of the improvement we saw in our district benchmarks last year, uh, including in the spring. Uh, then we saw TCAP scores uh, for proficiency that uh, significantly improved from, from the previous year. And uh, in fact, uh, we're, we're higher in, in improvement than we saw statewide. And uh, we just recently received our value added scores, which uh, gave the district the five on its one to five scale. And uh, I don't I haven't even shared this with Dr. Battle because I just discovered it today, but uh, our value added scores for ELA and mathematics for across grades four through eight uh, were in the top 10 in the state in both subject areas. <laughs> So 
So, as I said, uh, it's a, the positive about the accountability system is that it does use multiple measures. Uh, we have achievement and growth measures based on our TCAP achievement test. Uh, we look at what we call success rate. This is our proficiency in English language arts and mathematics across grade spans. For elementary, the state uses three through five, middle schools six through eight, high schools nine through 12. Uh, they, they look at both our overall achievement and the progress that's made in terms of achievement, uh, but we also average those in as, as we'll get into a little more detail with our value-added growth measures. And that value-added looks at how individual students make progress from year to year in, in, in terms of growth relative to the state. We also have measures for chronic chronically absent students. And to be chronically absent, a student misses 10 or more percent of days that they're enrolled. And both in terms of the absolute percentage and the improvement in that percentage, there are, there are scores assigned to districts. And in fact, for each of these indicators, the state uh, assigns a score from zero to four, and, and we'll, we'll look at an example of that. Uh, for English language proficiency, uh, that's how our English learner students do on English language proficiency assessments for, for this, uh, for the state of Tennessee, they use the WIDA access assessment. And each student has a target, uh, a goal, a expectation based on what's happened in past years in terms of students at that, at that proficiency level and the improvement they've made from year to year. And we're held accountable based on the percentage of students that, that meet their uh, expectation. And then we have graduation rate uh, as, as another indicator for high schools, but also uh, our ready graduates. Not just that they graduate, but that they graduate with uh, indications, evidence that they are college career ready. It could be based on an ACT score or other uh, early, uh, early indicators of, of success. And, and we'll get into those in a little more detail, uh, what those uh, indicators are. But again, uh, each of these measures is going to be weighted uh, on a four-point scale. And I will say, too, that uh, we will, as we, well, we look at this based on all students and what we call our uh, historically underserved student populations. Each of those indicators we saw calculations are made uh, for each of those measures for our black, Hispanic, and Native American students, for our economically disadvantaged English learners, students with disabilities. These are the subgroups that historically in Tennessee have fallen below uh, the state uh, average in terms of test scores. And I'm going to go over one example of an, an indicator. This is our student achievement indicator based on TCAP scores. And on the far left, you see the zero to four scale for this indicator. This is uh, for each of our tiers. There's an absolute performance scale. What percent of students were proficient on these exams in English language arts and mathematics? For instance, a school that had over 45% of their students that, that hit that uh, proficiency mark, and again, that's meeting or exceeding expectations on those TCAP tests, uh, they would get four points for that. If they fall between 35% and 45%, they get three points and so forth, as you see, and, and no points awarded if they fall below 20%. That's a one-time measure of, of student achievement, an absolute performance measure. But they also, uh, the state also looks at what progress they've made from the prior year. The state sets what we call annual measurable objectives, or AMOs. Based on your prior year performance, there's a very ambitious formula that's used in terms of setting a target for improvement. And how you do in terms of hitting that target uh, determines uh, the score you receive. If you hit the target, uh, you're gonna get at least three points. Uh, if you improve at a rate that's, and again, it's a very uh, challenging target, but if you hit a target that's even twice that in terms of improvement, uh, you are looking at a four-point uh, score for AMO. If you don't hit the AMO, but you come within the confidence interval, and that's just saying that we know that there's measurement error around this, but you're not significantly far from the AMO, you're gonna get two points. 
Uh, if you're at least within uh, the measurable error range of where you were the prior year, one point, and if you fall below that, in other words, you moved in the wrong direction, you, you get zero points. And the state uh, accountability system takes the higher of the two measures for absolute performance in AMO in terms of establishing your score for, uh, for achievement. But that's also averaging with our value added or growth score. And as I said earlier, there's, uh, the state has a one to five scale where three represents academic growth, which is equal to the, the state average. Uh, and five being a score that shows that there's significant evidence that you have exceeded the state. Uh, for, for a level five, you would get four points and, and so on down the scale. And uh, so all of that is computed again for each of those student groups that we were talking about. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Stenson to uh, go and do an example and also to, uh, to look at the rest of the accountability system and results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Changus. So the next thing we're going to look at is one actual example um, for one indicator for one student group. Um, and that is the all students, which is considered a student group. Um, what you're looking at is the success rate, which can be thought of as a weighted average of meeting or exceeding um, expectations. These are our actual data. Um, for one of our tiers. This is the six through eight tier. It comes very much like this, um, though, if you can believe it, just a little more cryptic than it, than it looks like up there. Um, we have the success rate that we made, which is a 22.5%, again, across reading and math and the um, equivalent subjects in high school. Then the next line you'll see is the confidence interval bound. That's, um, as Dr. Changus explained, um, an accounting of the measurement error, which means if we did this 100 times, 95% of the time, we'd get between a 22 and a 23. So that's the upper bound of that confidence interval. Next, you see the success rate in 2021. That was 14.1%. So you can see the huge leap that we made from uh, 2021 to 2022. Then you see our target. It's called AMO target for annual measurable objective. Um, I know it's very exciting. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, the annual measurable objective is um, targets that the state sets, um, ambitious but achievable. Um, I think um, Ms. Block knows that, that language. Um, basically meant to move our students up. The way AMOs are set, um, the lower you are, the more improvement you have to make to hit this annual measurable um, achievement. Then there's the double, um, which is an even more rigorous standard, very hard to make. Uh, then, as uh, Dr. Changus mentioned, you get points for the absolute pathway. In this case, we earned one point. However, um, we earned three points, um, which would be equivalent to a B um, if the state were giving letter grades this year, uh, which they, they decided not to. Um, on the AMO pathway, because we hit that, we actually exceeded that AMO quite a bit. Uh, they take the higher of those two, so a three, for that piece of the district accountability for this subgroup. Then um, there's the value added. We hit a level five for this grade range, even. Um, that earns four points, or an A, and then you average that A and that B, or that one and that three, and you come up with 3.5, which is an A um, for this overall indicator, for this, sub, uh, for this grade level, for this student group, okay? So we go and we do that for all of those measures that Dr. Changas showed you um, for every one of the subgroups. Um, and it comes up like this. On my screen, it's very dark. It made me nervous. Um, this is the state's actual um, look at this. Uh, you can take a look and see 
which ones we earned um, threes on, fours on, and so on um, for um, each of the um, various indicators. Then this is just for the all students subgroup. So all students earns its own little grade, which was advancing in this case um, because uh, it was, you know, they, they did a weighted average of each of these, um, each of these indicators for this group. And then they do the same thing for each subgroup uh, or each student group. Um, and each of them get, each uh, student group gets a score for each of the indicators and they come up with a sub, uh, a student group status, which was also advancing, but slightly lower at 2.25. So, um, you know, uh, just a little lower in the range, but still advancing. And then they take this at 40% of an overall grade and the all students group at 60% of the grade and give us our final accountability status, which was advancing um, because of our overall score, which you can see. So with this, um, I'm gonna switch over into school level accountability, which uses mostly this, they, it uses exactly the same measures, but they're weighted differently. Um, so it's not exactly the same. All schools, I think Dr. Battle mentioned this earlier, we have achievement, which is that success rate. So if you hear me go back and forth, I'm sorry, that's because the state does that and I just got used to talking about it that way. Growth, which is our value added. Chronically out of school, again, 10% or more of enrolled days. And the English language proficiency assessment. High schools also have graduation rate, that's worth 5% of the points, um, but ready graduates uh, is worth um, a good chunk more than that, and that's graduates with a 21 ACT or four early post-secondary opportunities or two post-secondary opportunities <coughs> plus earning a credential. And you'll hear a little bit today, I think later, about some of these credentials and the good news we have there. Um, they weight all of those metrics and come up with an overall grade. It's very much like what you would do as a teacher you know, um, achievement is worth 40% of your grade and growth is worth 30% of your grade. And, and they do that again for every one of the student subgroups mentioned before, student groups mentioned before, um, and come up with an overall grade. Um, 3.1 or higher is a reward school. It used to be different. I've gotten a lot of questions. You used to make it for growth or achievement. Now it's just this overall grade. Um, and that's how all those schools that you saw coming up here earned their reward school status. This is a list of them again, um, both um, district run and charter um, run. And you can see the, uh, the large number. And I wanted to point out that uh, last time we had 37 schools, eight of whom eight of which were charters. Um, this is 48 um, right now. But we'd also want to share the um, less good news, but we think we're going to get good news by the end of the year with schools that have earned status other than reward. Um, and we're going to go a little bit into that. Priority schools. Um, priority schools are the 5% of schools with the lowest success rates. Typically, we use three years of data. So it's your weighted average of reading and math across three years. This time it was two because of the pandemic. So it was 2019 and 2022 were averaged together um, that don't earn a level four or five TVOS in the most recent two years. Um, there's two pools um, for priority status, high school or K to eight and high schools who have a graduation rate below 67% are also designated as priority schools. 
So this is just the success rate. In this case, they don't look at your attendance, they don't look at your growth, except for this safe harbor of TVOS in the last two years. So it's just absolute one-time measure of achievement. And here's our 2022 priority school list. You can see the newly added priority um, schools, including the, um, one, the new charter school we have in priority status. This is fewer priority schools than we had last time. Um, we had 23 in the past, priority and comprehensive support. Um, so, um, and this year, because of the pandemic and the recovery from the pandemic, this is a one year instead of a three year status. So at the end of 2023, they're going to recalculate this with 2019, 22, and 23 data. So we're going to be pushing hard to get every one of these schools off this list um, as we go forward. Both at the time of new priority school rankings and between those times at the end of the year, we can exit schools from priority. Um, so obviously some of the ones that Dr. Battle mentioned before exited because they weren't on the next priority list. But also if a school exceeds the 10th percentile in the state um, for two years in a row, they can exit priority status. We had Rosebank exit in this way. Um, was it last year or the year before? Last year. Um, or you can exceed 15th percentile in the state based on the success rate for one year. Um, or you can earn a level four or five TVOS in all the, the content areas for two consecutive years. So um, we know that we have some priority schools that can, can make it this way. Um, if the priority status was due to underperforming subgroups, and I'll get into how that happens in a moment, um, the schools can exit by meeting AMO targets for that subgroup for two years. Um, and similarly with graduation rate, you can leave um, if you get your grad rate up. So here's our list of priority exits, um, STARS, are the um, reward schools that we celebrated a few minutes ago. Uh, next, we're gonna talk a little bit about focus schools, and there's two kinds of focus schools. The first is called targeted support and improvement. And those are schools whose overall accountability scores for a given student group are in the bottom 5% for one year. Again, that's for all the measures put together. Attendance, um, English language proficiency, graduation rate if you have it, growth and um, achievement. For this, they also um, give us racial ethnic subgroups um, to look at as well as the accountability groups that go into the district and most of the school level accountability. So each of them is broken out and given an overall grade on that zero to four scale. We only have four TSI schools um, and in my notes if I can uh, find them, I have how many we had before, but this is a very low number of schools. Um, and AZ Kelly, for example, um, as I mentioned, it's the bottom 5% in the state. AZ Kelly earned a B for their Asian subgroup, and that was the lowest 5% in the state. So it doesn't necessarily mean these schools are doing poorly with the student groups um, that they're identified for. Uh, it can be just an accident of luck. Um, you can also not be on this list if you get an A or a B in every single one of those areas. Um, so they had a C in one area and um, landed here. Um, this is a one-year status. We don't expect that these schools will be on this list um, for the next year. Uh, several of these, oh, not these schools, 
If you are a TSI school, you can also become an ATSI school, and AC, ATSI stands for Additional Targeted Support and Improvement. So only schools identified in that bottom 5% for all measures are ranked for ATSI identification. And what they do then is look strictly at the success rate. And if that success rate, that average percent um, meeting or exceeding um, expectations is below the rate at which you become a priority school, then you get the ATSI designation. So they're not ranking English learners against English learners at that point. They're ranking English learners against the bottom 5% for all students, right? So it's, it can be very difficult to um, stay out of this uh, status if you have a particularly underserved set of students. Um, if a school is on the ATSI list for two cycles for the same su sub um, set of students, they will become priority schools, but that is not starting until um, that cycle will start on the 22-23 identification. Uh, it's been in place, we just have never had enough data to actually do this. Um, here are our ATSI schools. There are only five of them. Again, we are much lower than we, than we were in the past. Um, this is a very low number of schools, and uh, we are very proud of that. And um, you can see the subgroups for which the schools are identified. Again, this is a one-year rate this time. Um, it would be three years. So. We have high hopes that these schools will not show up on this list next year. Um, these, uh, these schools do have um, occasionally another TSI subgroup. However, you take whatever the lowest status is um, for state accountability. And um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Battle and uh, step back from the podium. Yes, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tina. That was a pretty simple process for me. <laughs> yeah, so um, again, we, we definitely rely on their expertise and coaching and guidance for our executive directors um, and um, our principals. And I just want to close with, like, we know a lot about the successes we've had um, as a district. We know where we need to double down. I think on this slide, you just see some of the things that did happen, particularly last school year, that we're continuing to deepen our practice around um, the in-person learning environment. We know strategies around our tier one instruction. We know how to appropriately intervene. You could also imagine, particularly with our priority schools, our ATSI and our TSI schools, because of specific needs, we know exactly uh, what we will be doing and targeting um, those student groups to make sure that we have intentionality around um, their education um, daily. We know how important our um, teachers and our staff and our principals are um, to our students. You cannot replace um, their ability to really pour into our students, to personalize their learning, to be responsive um, to their needs. Um, I do want to point out um, two specific things in the data, one around a chronic absenteeism. Um, just for context, just reminding us that at the start of the 21-22 to school year, particularly with response to our, the pandemic, there was a 10-day uh, quarantine, right? And, um, or isolation. I might get my terms mixed up at this point. Um, we've been talking about it for three years. But if you think back to the definition of chronic absenteeism, that's 10 days, right? And so we know that we've got to be very intentional about this. We move forward the second semester a little ways through, we changed to five um, days. But we know that there were some disruptions caused um, by that. While we had a um, leeway system in place um, last school year, um, it still took a response from student and family in order for us to document it in that way and action um, as students were um, home uh, recovering from, from COVID. So I just 
just want to acknowledge that. I also want to point out that state law has changed um, this year, so we have even more, um, even less, excuse me, flexibility with regards to how we document students who might be out um, due, to, due to COVID. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge, if you were digging into our data, particularly the um, growth um, for our English learners um, was significant um, last school year. And again, I'm very thankful to all of our teams, the, the EL team, um, again, just plugging in um, and being uh, responsive. Uh, we know our student groups. We know where we've had significant progress. We know the areas that we need to continue to um, double down around as we we move throughout this upcoming school year. And so we are shifting um, as we move forward uh, with our schools of innovation, our newly named priority schools. They will stay where they are. They will not be shifting structure um, this year because it is our expectation with this one year um, pull that those um, schools will be exiting back off of the priority school list, but we will have targeted supports in place um, for those schools. So I will pause there, uh, Madam Chair, for just a moment to see if there's any questions. Um, um, for this team, and as they're finalizing and responding to the final questions, if you may have them, I'm going to ask um, Jennifer Bell, our Director of Academies of Nashville, to come and start preparing for update, a brief update around the Academies of Nashville. Thank you for that update. Um, as you know, colleagues, but as some of you may not know, uh, remember that all questions are to be direct, directed to Dr. Battle, um, though she may have staff that answer your questions. So if you have any questions or concerns, will you please <coughs> let me know? All right, Frida, will you go ahead first? So this is a technical question. Um, so for priority school status, so no matter what, there's always gonna be priority school because it's, it's not a threshold to so like, if let's say we're all Olympians and three of us came first, second, third, and the rest of us came in, but we're still in the top 10 in the world, we would put in priority status because we're in the bottom half. Like, is that a good analogy that there's not a threshold that you have to clear like a mile in four minutes, no matter if you do clear the mile in four minutes, if you're bottom of the four minutes, it doesn't matter. There will always be priority schools. Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Ms. Bugs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Dr. Battle, you know, I've been talking to you about just different narratives in the community, making sure that the community not only understands what these different terms mean, but they understand how they can tap in and support. You know, we've been working with Pencil, we've been working with other organizations, parent groups. I talked to you about looking at the top performing schools to understand what kind of community support do they have, whether it's school support organizations, PTOs, fundraising capacity. Is that something that this team can work on? Because I think it's something that we as a board could kind of take on to take to the community and say, look, our schools as a whole are thriving. But when you look at the top performing schools, look at how much they fundraised. Look at how many volunteers they have on a yearly basis. Look at how long their, their PTO has been standing. Those are the kind of things that I think I will take on now that I'm no longer in leadership with your, um, with your blessing, both Madam Chair and Dr. Battle. Any thoughts there? Is there somewhere that something that I should be looking towards, someone that I could be working with in the community? Yeah, so, so two quick things. Yes, we can provide that information to all board members for your respective um, district schools. The second thing is we do have some very specific um, data that you'll hear a little bit about when you hear our Academies of Nashville um, presentation with our Academies model um, and the business and community investment in our schools, which have the direct correlation to um, where we are with performance um, with those particular schools. But that is something that we can provide and share. Uh, we welcome partnership. Uh, I, I think I've shared this on multiple occasions. Um, early on in my career as a professional educator, I learned you cannot do this alone. Um, as a aspiring educator, I wanted to just jump in there and, and, and get everything done all at one time. And you learn very quickly, year one, um, that you need that continued um, um, support from home to school, school to home, the community. Um, so I'll be happy to partner with you in that way and provide um, that relevant data to all of our board members. Thank you so much for supporting that effort. But last question, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. When we look at school elementary schools that are underperforming, many of them are seeing students come in uh, with foundational skills that have not been established. They need different supports in their community or in their home. It's not quite an MNPS, it's not something that's on our, um, 
our job requirement. You know, how do you make sure that a child, as soon as they are born, before they come into MNPS, that they have supports? How, how do we as a community, how do we as a school system begin to look toward making sure that when, ele when that first grader who's already a grade level behind comes into our school, how do we support them? And, and are there ways, are there things you think we as a community can be doing to support them even before they come to us? Very yeah. loaded question, I know. Yeah, no, it's timely. Um, right now, our um, early, our pre-K um, early learning team is um, digging into some um, data and creating a plan that I am excited to bring before this board um, sometime in the near future, um, just addressing um, the, the entry point and level um, of our students and how we might intervene um, early. I think, you know, just historically, we've, we've been in the K or pre-K 12 space, I think realistically as we're talking about continuing to move the needle for our students, uh, we have to pay attention to the early childhood space as well and looking at those partnerships um, with the Blueprint, United Way, other partners um, who have already been in this work, um, how we're leveraging um, the Imagine... Um, Imagination Library, is that what it's called? Yes, yes. yes. Um, those resources um, in our community, forgive me. Um, and so we are, um, I'm very proud of our team who's um, leading that work and I'm looking for David uh, Williams and, and Mason. Um, they've been putting their heads together um, over the last um, few months to year um, around how we might intervene and support early um, to make sure or to kind of guarantee our students are set up for success at that point of entry into Metro National Public school. So stay tuned um, for that. Uh, we'll be bringing that before the bo board again in the near future. That is phenomenal. I do just want to elevate that that's not something that MNPS was necessarily called to do. So the idea that you and your team are already looking at what happens as soon as a child is born, how they come to us, will be the game changer for our school. We are, we are the youth focus for Nashville. So I appreciate yes. that. Thank you. And if I can just add, we, we have to. And, and it will be a call on the community um, to really rally around us and support us um, in this effort. We cannot wait um, particularly, we have a lot of conversations about third grade literacy. We cannot wait to third grade. We cannot wait to kindergarten and even pre-K. We've got to make sure that the supports are in our community early um, and that we're supporting our families um, in preparation for the, the, the pre-K um, 12 experience. Thank you. Ms. Masters? Thank you. I just, I have a clarifying question about determining priority school status. So priority schools are identified by pool, K through eight or and high school. So does this mean that all K through eight are lumped together? Okay, so that might explain why there are so many middle schools in priority status. I mean, they're being compared to elementary schools. Got it, okay. Interesting. Um, my second question is around um, when a charter school moves into priority status and um, what sort of steps um, we are to take as a district. Yeah, thank you um, for your question. So, um, Renita Perry, if you don't mind approaching the podium um, to respond to that, this is this might be a first um, for us in my recollection that we've had a um, charter school be designated as a priority school. Um, and so, to Miss Masters' questions, what by law, by our own um, administrative procedures and policies, does that require for us to respond to? Yes, thank you for this opportunity to speak. So currently we're in a situation in our MNPS authorization handbook. It states that we will recommend revocation for that charter school. It is in accordance with the state board policy um, that say that we may do so as well. All right, and if I, just to um, expand upon the definition, um, according to state policy, technically a charter school cannot operate as a priority school. No, ma'am, it cannot. Okay. So is any action needed on the part of the board to... So no action forward? is needed tonight. Um, I, I just want to um, call out that the embargo around the accountability data was just lifted yesterday. Um, and so we had to do a number of notifications and, and updates. And so our team um, will be continuing to pull together the necessary information for this board to consider. Um, and we'll bring that before you at a later date. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Tyler? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I, I may have missed this. And I just wanted to check for a chronically out of school, does it, whether or not it's excused or unexcused, does that make, does not make a difference? Is that correct? Does not make a difference. Okay. And I, let me repeat that for my team to confirm. Chronically absenteeism, um, it is excused and, un excused and unexcused absences. It is. It, um, for accountability, one thing I failed to mention is that the student does need to be enrolled for at least half the year. That was going to be my next question. So we have a population who are really highly transitory. Um, and how is that impacting our chronic absenteeism and... Um, Sometimes they do not withdraw, even if they're moving to another county, um, and we don't know about it till later. Um, what is in place for us to make sure that we're um, trying to do our best yeah. to capture that information and, and present it accurately? Yeah, our team um, has been digging into that as well. We're actually going to put some um, extra layers in place to help try to track down um, that information. I mean, and you call out chronic absenteeism. We're also seeing that impact graduation rates um, as well. And so um, in, in one particular community where we have a higher transient population, um, particularly relocating out of the country, it makes it very difficult um, for the school team to document and have the proper um, documentation um, to either withdraw or appeal um, those students' particular data. Um, and so we have um, strong processes in place in our enrollment centers, um, but it is, it's just difficult, particularly when you're relocating out of state, mm -hmm. out of country, which tends to be um, representative of the higher number, higher population of our students. Um, so if a student decides, or if a family of a student needs to leave and they go somewhere else and they forget to withdraw, or they do not turn in that paperwork, or they don't let us know for whatever reason, do we have the ability to kind of backdate to when they left so that we are being accurate with our data? We do have the ability um, to do that. Team, feel free to chime in if, if needed. Uh, we do have the opportunity to, to backfill. Um, if the process works well, which we don't have a lot of control over, the receiving school <laughs> should send a request to the school that the child is coming from um, so that we have proper documentation and so that we can also release records. It does not always happen that way, but that is what should happen in that process. And so we try to follow up. Um, I mean, you can imagine we, we call, we email, we home visit, we search social media, we try to find where our students are when they're not present um, in our schools. And I'll yield for a moment to see if Tina, Paul, Moore, if anybody wants to add anything to that process. Um, on the dropout front, um, that becomes greatly difficult, not just on the back end. Um, so uh, a student leaves once they've been gone for 10 days and we, you know, we withdraw them. It can be hard to find somebody. We can take affidavits and things like that. We have to prove every single student who has left the district has enrolled somewhere else. However, when students also when students come to us, uh, if they have not been enrolled in a Tennessee school before, and they come at the age of 16 or 17, and they leave, those are our absences and those are our dropouts. There is absolutely nothing we can do. Um, we can say they came from Mexico, they were here for two weeks, they left. That's a dropout right there. Um, and um, I, I did just want to add with the chronic absenteeism for, um, for the last year, um, needless to say, schools were allowing a lot of grace to students who were either sick themselves or who had sick family members and had to take care of their siblings. And I believe that it does explain a lot of the chronic absenteeism on top of, you know, the, the, the CDC recommendations. Um, so we might not have dropped a student that we would have pri dropped in a prior year earlier. So like they might have had 15 days absent instead of 10. Yeah, yeah. And just to reiterate, um, chronic absenteeism, 10% of the school year absent, whether it is excused or unexcused. Okay, I appreciate the clarity around that. Um, 
And then I had another question about our additional targeted support and improvement schools. Um, so it, you mentioned that sometimes one, a school could have more than one TSI and that they look for the lowest. Um, if we have a school who would exit based on their lowest group, but their next lowest group would remain, how does that work? So TSI, um, that's the targeted support, that is run every single year. Mm -hmm. So um, they won't go to the next lowest group. What they are doing is looking at, the, the school takes the lowest um, designation, is what I meant that makes to sense. say. got it. So okay. um, even one of our priority schools would have been a, a B school this year, right? So, but they can't be a B school because they're a priority school, right? Um, which is why it's so important that people uh, understand and are able to speak to their data at the schools for recruiting because it doesn't mean the school is not a good school for your child. So. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Okay, that's what I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gentry? Uh, thank you so much, and, and thank you to my colleagues for the questions that have already been answered. Uh, I do want to go back to the, the app chronic absenteeism. Dr. Battle, I, if I recall correctly, at some point prior to the world falling apart, we were doing better. We had done, we had a concentrated effort and activities around addressing chronic absenteeism, especially around the groups, the student groups that are reflected in, in here. And so do we believe that those strategies once re-employed uh, will show a difference in the data? I know we'll still have the five days and, the, and some of that, um, but are we, we thinking that those strategies are still effective? Yeah, I, I think we're extremely clear on the strategies that help um, bolster um, attendance of our students and to decrease um, the level of chronic absenteeism. What we're still monitoring is the impact of the pandemic, of, the, of COVID, um, on our students. So that is still um, something we're navigating, but do we know the strategies that help improve and help support families around attendance? We're, we're, we're clear on that. Um, in fact, um, a few years ago, when we had a um, um, number of schools exit um, prior to school status. And one of the things that we consistently saw was their community achieves model and that support um, around um, attendance as a specific pillar um, of success. And so we, we know the levers to pull on for attendance. Um, again, we're having to keep a close monitor on um, how that five day um, absence is having an impact on um, overall chronic absenteeism. And just for clarity, and make sure I understood it correctly, if a student just stops showing up and I'm able to confirm that that student has transferred, then can I retrofit that day back to the last time I saw them in school? Yes, you can. Okay, so I can, I can clear that up. And uh, just to go back to Ms. Bug's comments, I mean, I've also had several schools, and I look at the priority schools list, and some of those um, are parents of those schools that are reaching out, wanting PTOs, wanting to get involved, and, and wanting to partner. Just want to, and, and Ms. Bugs knows this really well, she's been doing some really good meetings in 37208, uh, and the outcomes of that have been very obvious. So I would love to work with you to see how we package that and toolkit it. You know, that's, that's my favorite word these days. Uh, how we toolkit it and make it something manageable. I think, and I'll, I'll just to be transparent, the, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, the, the thought and the, the messaging is that there's school-level resistance to the establishment of the PTO. And so we just need to figure out what's the expectation. And again, I do believe that Ms. Bug's request of what's the secret sauce? What are those factors or elements that exist consistently across the schools that are doing well, uh, are exiting priority status, exiting from priority straight to reward specifically? What's, what are the elements that, are ex that exist in that building? You know, is it high parental engagement? Is it partnerships? What is it um, that exists there? We may not be able to do the Paul Changes job of determining correlation and causality, but uh, 
but we know that something about that is making a difference. So I look forward to seeing that as well and just finding a way to come up with some Maybe men, we did a lot of this during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Many of those Facebook, we would go live on Facebook and do presentations. Um, Dr. Naba McKinney was a part of that as well and inform families about things during that time period. I think we can go back and use that same strategy to talk about those factors that have made a difference and that we believe make a difference in student outcomes. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Gentry. One of our um, signature initiatives um, is around um, our inquiries and um, the evaluation, uh, particularly with our work with peer and partnership with Vanderbilt, evaluating um, how particular programs, strategies, efforts are correlating to student outcomes. So I look forward to um, sharing um, some, some more updates um, with the board around that. I know just recently um, we, we shared some data around um, one particular strategy and the correlation for those cohort of students um, and their outcomes. So we are trying to uh, ramp up <laughs> with those evaluations and we will report that information out as quickly as we can. Um, along the same lines, and I'm, I love this conversation around um, what kinds of things we can discover around particular schools that are having success. And um, certainly, you know, from a variety of research, we know that some of the things that um, Ms. Bugs and, and Dr. Gentry have named are, are the case. But, and I'm curious to know um, if there's an effort maybe with peer or that um, within the research evaluation um, office also to look at a similar thing, but around um, the growth, so just the level five status or overall growth, um, if there are things we can learn about schools that have consistently grown sort of over a number of years and the types of, uh, of efforts that they have in place, whether these things have to do with consistent leadership or teachers or support organizations, um, I think that could be, um, I'd be really curious just to know what we can know. Um, because as you look at some of the, the data and what I think, you know, as we see people moving out of status, often growth is a big part of that and value-added growth is a big part of that and being able to try and replicate that across schools will be really important as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I'm kind of channeling my team right now, there's no silver bullet, right? We, we know uh, with intentionality, however, um, you can um, grow your students and increase the level of achievement or success rate. Um, the one thing that we are um, really strengthening our structures and, and, and kind of weaving throughout our leadership framework is drilling down to the individual student data. And, and this speaks to our every student known. Um, if we sit just with where the district is or where a school is, we'll continue to either miss the mark or make just incremental growth. Um, it is imperative that we drill down to the individual student data. That is what's going to inform us most um, around how to intervene, how to support, how to inspire um, our students even um, around the goals that we have um, set for them. And so we're spending a tremendous amount of time um, around our structures, our practices, um, building our toolbox um, to respond to the individual needs um, of our students. And there are going to be um, some efforts when you talk about your tier one instruction that should be um, accessible for all students, but we've got to know our students well enough um, to know when we need to shift, when we need to accelerate, uh, when we need to, you know, kind of reset um, based upon um, wh where they are. And so I, I just want to share that just kind of level setting that conversation that any, there's no silver bullet. There's not one way approach to get every student where they need to be. We have to know our students well. That's why our mantra is every student known. That is what I press upon. That is what I look for. That is what I ask about uh, when I'm looking at school plans, when I'm visiting schools. How are we ensuring that every student is known? What do those, those planning structures look like? How do we provide feedback to our students? How are we getting those navigators connected to our students so that we know them? Them, and that we can, again, by design, um, create a system that works for them and support them as well. Dr. Gentry? And I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to double back, but so I don't see in this list our, um, several of our other models of schools, right? So our, um, the ALCs are not on here. And, and I'm just wondering if we can at some point get a presentation of those schools that we don't talk about a lot. 
right? So our ALCs, the Opera Mills Academies, um, and things of that nature. I would just love to see how we're serving those students, if the every student known model is reaching them, uh, and if it's not, where are the opportunities that still remain for that population of students? We can absolutely do that, and we're gonna kick off tonight talking about our Academies of Nashville, um, and that model that exists um, in um, our high schools, many of which you don't see represented um, in this data tonight, but we have a strong um, national model um, around what we're doing to accelerate their outcomes. Okay. Dr. Pathina, you have a question? Um, Dr. Battle, I have a quick you, question. You touched upon real briefly that the state law has changed re related to protocols around COVID. Can you explain what those changes are and what the limits are and how that will impact um, also our chronic absenteeism and the discussions we've been having recently. Yeah, some of the, um, two of the particular laws that have sunset is um, our students' ability to learn in the virtual setting. There is a little flexibility given the um, response um, of the school district. I think there's like, if you have to call it for the school, I think there's up to 10 days that you can do that um, as a school district, if I recall appropriately. But the way in which the individual um, 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 virtual learning um, that's not allowable in our traditional um, schedule unless a student is assigned or enrolled in our MPS virtual school. The second thing, um, the second law that did sunset, or I think this was a state board policy team, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was that students who were um, out um, for up to 10 days due to um, a health response due to COVID, um, if with proper documentation and academic progress, um, the parent could um, um, <clears throat> confirm um, that the student's engagement, we can confirm in our system um, the work of the students, and we could mark those um, absences as excused. So it did help um, with the excused absences, but it still did count, correct me if I'm wrong, towards chronic absenteeism. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Did you want to add something, Justin? I was just going to say that's correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that question. The, the, the follow-up question to that is, are the new protocols or the new limits listed on website, on your website to make it accessible to parents so that if a student comes down with COVID, they know what the new protocol is and the process is for quarantine or absenteeism? Yes, or we communicated like that. Um, that information out before the start of the school year, at the start of the school year um, with our back to school um, information. I believe it is also posted um, on our website, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, where can we find it? <laughs> is it on the student, um, the parent student handbook page? Uh, um, yes, and then also um, there's a uh, page designated for uh, student health and COVID um, as well. Okay, student COVID, I'm sorry, so health, student health. Oh, student okay. health, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and, oh, did you say something else? You said you're welcome. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, another question that I have is, um, I know the, the focus of the district is um, on every student known and the work that we're doing within our schools, um, with our principals, our teachers, our support staff, the hub and all of that. Um, how do parents fit into that equation and how can we engage parents in the process of building that community so that everyone has the same message of every student known um, and we're all heading on the same road? Uh, I mean, I think that's a very simple response in that in order to know our students, um, I mean, we have to know what works for them, we have to know their challenges, we have to know their aspirations. Um, that takes conversations with the student, that takes conversation with the parents, that takes, um, you know, knowing what clubs and extracurricular activities they're involved in. I mean, it takes all of that. And so um, through the efforts of Navigator, through the efforts of our, um, even our personalized dashboard, which in its ideal state will have, um, 
a two-way communication tool that we're we'll pushing towards um, to encourage um, those those conversations when we embark upon parent-teacher conferences and other communications and tools um, with parents um, it is kind of undergirded with um, our mantra of every student known and so that will continue to be um, um, pushed and, and echoed across our schools and if you haven't noticed not only have we been pushing towards every student known we've been um, talking about every employee known every school known um, and so we continue to um, deepen our practice around what that looks like what that sounds like what does it mean um, to each leader across our district as a follow-up to that, thank you, Dr. Battle. As a follow-up to that question, um, for parents who are um, struggling to support their children at home, maybe they don't know how to do homework support, or they're they're trying to increase that parent connection, that parent support at home. Um, how can we uh, support parents in that way? What what can parents do to get that level of support if they need it? I think there's uh, several lines of um, action there. The first thing I will always encourage a parent to do is to talk to the teacher. Um, and of course, we have systems in place for communication um, with um, our teachers, our counselors, um, our leaders. The school team is going to be um, the best support. We also um, keep uh, pretty updated on our website, other resources and tools, and our school team send them home. Um, homework help with homework hotline, um, tutoring through our uh, promising no, nope. Accelerating Scholars um, program, uh, what happens over the summer with our enrichment program. And so we're continuing to um, try to expand upon um, and be responsive to um, our parents um, who are in need of that support or if they don't. We just want to make sure that our students have um, what they need. So reach out to the teacher, counselor, principal, um, access the resources that we are sending home, check out our website. We will continue to have family um, uh, convenings um, as needed. We will soon be kicking off our Family University series um, in response to the feedback that we are receiving and the, the basic needs of our families to support the learning of our students at home and in school. Great. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I have one more question, y'all. Um, back to the absent, the chronically out of school data, um, I'm looking at this group, and is this all schools or is this just K through eight? On or? slide 10, you're On looking at 10. all scores for stu all student groups. Okay, so for this, um, I noticed that our English language learners for chronically out of school actually did okay. Um, and it was our other subgroups for um, uh, black, Hispanic, Native American, economically disadvantaged and our students with disabilities um, that that um, did not do as well. Um, were there any particular strategies that we used with our ELL students that we can transcend across our other subgroups um, to be able to better support the attendance? Um, or did I misread that? No, no, no. You're right. We've, we've had this. We've had these conversations um, already. Um, so yes, there again is not just one answer um, to that question, but we're also um, digging into the individual school data. We'll be leaning um, in with principals and school communities who um, were able to maintain um, that um, lower level of chronic absenteeism to learn specifically from them what they've um, done. Uh, part of our PLN and our principal leadership network um, structure now is very heavy on principals sharing best practices with one another. And so we've had that very conversation because I think um, lots of assumptions um, could be made about our student data. And I think this is one of the challenges, um, some of the assumptions that are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tyler, and then I'll ask my question. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of put a bug in our thoughts about moving forward about how the new third grade retention law is going to affect this um, and how when you kind of backload a group of students who are underperforming in one level altogether, what does that do to the data? How will that affect us? How will that change the way we approach the, the issue? How will that change the way we try to um, look at it? I have no answers for that, unfortunately, um, but I'm, I'm willing to yeah. you know, dig in with you guys as well. I just, it's a large, <laughs> large concern of mine. Yeah, it's a concern of our team as well. Um, we've got a committee who's been working towards um, 
unpacking and supporting um, around that particular law. Um, I know Tina and I spoke specifically around um, the impact, particularly on the most current cohort um, of students. Uh, we also know that we have um, um, initiatives in place right now, like our Accelerating Scholars, that um, um, could help um, us take the scale of support um, uh, for our students across um, the district. Quite frankly, um, I know that there's lots of chatter um, across the state around the negative impact that um, this law um, can and will have on students. And so uh, we are leaning into that conversation and um, supporting the efforts um, to get to um, the legislators around uh, why this is not a good idea. It's not a good practice um, in supporting um, our students. And so let's continue to talk and chat around um, how we might support um, that effort. And at the same time, uh, we're working internally around what impact this will have um, on MMPS, our students, um, and how we can intervene early to try to avoid um, that particular situation. Thank you. I guess on that note, my question is, since someone has to be at the bottom, um, even though we have all discussed that there's times where you're not necessarily a bottom ranking situation here, um, and they're re-ranking them after a year, are they also re-ranking the reward schools? Reward schools is a one-year status at all times, so yes, okay. we will have a new batch. Just making sure that's continued, okay? Um, and because our reward schools, we're saying that we're feeling that part of the reason that there's been an increase is because there's been a push of surrounds, surrounding supports and other kinds of wraparound things that we've been doing. There's an initial push of benefit for that. What are our concerns about that wavering or tapering off, and is this sustainable? Well, our our core signature signature initiative was around our um, literacy reimagine, and it's really about um, ensuring that the core instruction um, was accessible and available to all students, regardless of the school that they um, attended. And so, again, as far as sustainability and in our investments, we've um, invested <laughs> greatly in professional development um, for all of our teachers at this point, because we started with elementary, moved into the secondary space. Um, part of this is being able to maintain the resources um, and the level of professional development we need, quality professional development we need in place um, for our students. I think, and I'm, I'm very proud of the work of this board and the intentionality around our aspirational budgeting process. Um, we've been very strategic, again, and intentional with how we have leveraged um, non-recurring funds with operational funds. We've already been able to move some of these key strategies over to our operational budget. For instance, when you talk about wraparound services and our advocacy centers um, in our schools, um, the majority of them, all but 14 of our schools, have that particular program in our operational budget. And so we'll just need to pay careful attention as we're moving into this next, next budget cycle and for the following year um, to have that sustainability represented in our operational budget. And I'll just be quite frank and honest. We're going to be um, transparent about what's working, what's not working. Working. Um, if it's not working, we will not be recommending <laughs> that we um, get those recurring funds into our operational budget. We'll, we'll pivot and we'll, we'll look. Right now, um, most most of what we're seeing is positive impact on our students. We had some other learnings this year around. Um, um, students represented in our schools and some data we've been looking at most recently around enrollment um, that I'm looking forward to sharing an update with the board around as well. So while we've been implementing those signature initiatives, we've had some other pilots happening around strategies that uh, we will likely want to take to scale as well that will help us sustain um, and accelerate at the same time um, those outcomes for our students. And we're staying focused on those focus outcomes around literacy, numeracy, social emotional learning, which includes discipline, attention, and our goal is, and, and we were very close to this, having 100% of our students with transition plans. Great. Um, I'm very excited about, of course, our increase of uh, reward schools. I think it's really important that we have discussed it and that we have all had a big celebration of it. And I, I think that that's necessary because there's been a ton of work put in there. And that's not just a single, like you mentioned, silver bullet um, decision that's been that's allowed us to get to that. Um, 
I personally have some concerns always with the state accountability matrix. Um, and I feel like it's not a clear vision of the true success sometimes of our schools. But there's been an incredible amount of work that's been done by our students, staff, and teachers. And that absolutely needs to be recognized. And I'm glad it has been. Um, and there's so many good things that happen in our schools, and there's so many good reasons to choose MMPS. This is just one of them. Um, and so I, I guess with that, if we, can we move on to the academies? Another great reason. We sure can. Um, again, thank you, Tina. Thank you, Paul, um, for your accountability update. We will turn it over now to Jennifer Bell, our director of the Academies of Nashville, for a brief update around our same model. All right. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Thank you, Madam Board Chair Elrod. I must say that's a great name. It sounds wonderful on you. Um, for the next few moments, I'm going to take you guys through some updates about the Academies of Nashville in preparation for this evening. I decided we're going to take a journey. And so we're going to take a journey through the historical landscape that brought the Academies of Nashville to fruition. And we're going to talk about where we are, and we're also going to talk about where we're going. And so it's always important to note that we have 35 academies that are represented across 12 of our schools. Each of those 12 zone, uh, schools are 12 zoned high schools. But what brought us here? I want to set a tone for you in the historical context and talk about 2006. All right, in 2006, our graduation rate was less than 60%, right at 50, 57%. And that wasn't even in four years, that was in five years. So it took 50, five years for 57% of our students to graduate. At that same time, Robert Balfans, he was an author and he was representing John Hopkins University, he wrote a nationally recognized article about eight dropout factories right here in our very own school district. So what that led to is it just led to a lot of rumbling about our, our school district, about our high schools, and so there was just a lack of public support rallying around our schools, that including not only our community, our, our, our chamber was asking for the mayor takeover. We had schools that were at risk of state takeover under No Child Left Behind. And so faced within um, some of these challenges, it was really our principals. Our principals came together and they said, we want to see transformation. We want to see... Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry. We want to see the evolution of our, of our high schools, and we need support of everyone with that. So for the next five or six minutes of time. But I was going to, uh, okay. if you don't mind, can we send this particular video? Out to, I, know, I thought about I know it. I know it was my fault. I know. Thank I didn't bring you. popcorn either, so it was fair. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to walk you through, all right? There's a great video, and you're all going to receive it in your inbox. We're going to watch it, too. <laughs> <laughs> But let's talk about the three <laughs> strands of the Academies of Nashville, okay? So when we think about the three strands that uh, allow this work to, to take place, the first one is a transformation of teaching and learning. And so I want you to ask yourself, go back to when you're in school and you remember sitting there and you asked your teacher, you said, why do we have to learn this? All right, is there, I ask that daily, all right? Mm -hmm. But through that, we want to shift away from, the, we know the why. Because we're in our classroom, we see the relevance. Our teachers are making connections to us through geometry with things that are actually happening out in the world. All right, I'm seeing these same themes applied throughout my, in my English class, my math class, class, my CTE, even down in my wellness room. All right, we're seeing these, these, uh, the necessity and, and the importance and the value of what it is that we're wanting to learn. We're also practicing collaboration. So project-based learning, more inquiry learning, a hands-on approach. And so through the transformation of, of teaching and learning, we move away from um, myself as the teacher standing in front of the class and I'm delivering instruction, but it's a full-on engagement of that instruction. Um, with that became the influx and increase in the capacity for students to take place in advanced academics to earn those IB, those AP credits, those dual enrollment credits. And then also ensuring that our teachers were trained. Because if we're going to transform what we do in the classroom, we've got to know how to do that. So investing in uh, training such as like how to team, how to collaborate with other teachers and project-based learning. In addition to that, you go to the second strand. And the second strand is transforming the secondary school experience. And let's start with that, the Freshman Academy, all right? A freshman academy in our schools, did you know that research suggests that on average 75% of students who do not complete ninth grade do not graduate? So through the transformation of our high schools, we were able to create a smaller learning community. I went to a school with over 3,000 students. I felt like a number. 
I love my high school, but I felt like a number. But when we transformed our high schools, we created these smaller learning communities, freshman seminar being, I'm sorry, freshman academy being one of those, where I have a cohort of teachers, an academy principal, a counselor, who are all supporting us as students. So we've created a smaller school within our schools, and those would become known as academies. In addition to that, we have our third strand, and that's transforming the business and civic engagement. And we really needed to, as a former academy principal in an academy of aviation who was also afraid of flying, <laughs> it was gonna be quite a challenge for me to talk to my students about aeronautics. But if I can go out and I can learn from the airport and I can er learn from Triumph and I can learn from some of our partners, then I can come back and achieve strand one of bringing relevance into the classroom because I can make connections, but also to be able to bring leaders throughout our city into our schools and provide our students with these real world experiences. Because if I want to uh, believe it, I have to see it. All right, and so when we have those three strands implemented with fidelity, we can achieve four R's. And the first one is rigor. And the best definition I ever heard of rigor was said that it is something that's a little bit hard. So what's a little bit hard for you might not be a little bit hard for me and vice versa. But it's always challenging us through strand one, transforming the way that we teach in our classrooms for every one of our students, every student known, to be challenged to do something that's a little bit hard for them. The second R is relevance. It's creating those connections. We're removing that why question from the classroom we're replacing with, I get it. But we see the connections and the work that we're doing, not only in our academy, but also in the skills that we need throughout everyday life. Then our relationships. We're, by creating those smaller learning communities that strand two, we're building relationships because now we have a smaller group of students. I am known by my students, I mean by my, my teachers, and I feel that connection. And then finally, you have readiness. So the readiness applies all three of the strands. It's that I've had opportunity to uh, uh, earn that advanced academic credit. I've also had the opportunity to go out and explore with our business leaders in our community. And I have been taught and prepared with the professionalism skills and the trade skills I need to be successful in college and career. Through the Academy model, we have tiers to our experiential learning. It starts in the ninth grade. But as you all know, we know the experience you'll learn in college career readiness actually begin in kindergarten, but I'm focused today on the academies of Nashville. All right, so in ninth grade, every student participates in a career fair. It's the first time we're having it in person, November 8th. Come on down, Music City Center. Um, but we will have hundreds of professionals out in our community that will come. All of our high schools will be represented, um, and students will be able to learn and be introduced to various careers um, throughout the city. They'll also begin starting their college visits. In the 10th grade year, we challenge for 100% of our students to have an industry-related tr uh, field trip. Because if I, I might know that I, I want to go into health care, but all I really know is that there's nurses and doctors. But if I visit and I see all and explore all the other careers that exist out there in that industry, I, my, my wheels start turning. The third one is in 11th grade years with a job shadowing. So now I'm not only visiting that business, but I'm also spending time with a, a cohort or a, an employer themselves, or I'm doing an internship. A great example of that is think about our credit unions in our schools. We have students who take their each level of their course. By the 12th grade year, they're completing, um, they're running the banks inside their schools, but then they're going working in their out of school time in summers at the local branches in those internships. In the 12th grade year, and I shared a little bit about this last spring, and we continue to celebrate as our career practicum, where our students are not only learning what it's like to work in a job uh, that will lead them to opportunities in high school, high wage, but also earning wages on an average of $15 an hour. And then we have to look at the numbers. So let's look at where we were in 2006, and let's look at where we are now. So a graduation rate, 57.8%, took five years to get to 57.8%, and in 2021, 20, uh, 2022, coming off the hills, actually let's replace that, still in a pandemic, our graduation rate at 81.8%. Do the math on how many more students graduated that would not have if we stayed on that trajectory of 57.8%. Attendance rates, on average, 2006, 87.8%. Um, we've seen those go up. We did see, we have to be honest with ourselves, we have had the impact of a pandemic. We're seeing that recover, though. 
even through that our students return. So I'm excited to see where those are. Looking at average daily attendance rates over the start of the school year, we're on a positive track there. And our suspension rates, here's a big one. When students are in the classroom, then they can get all four of those R's. But with our student interventions and our teaming model of cohorts of teachers that are supporting students, we've seen reductions in suspension rates by over um, from 32 percent all the way down to 11 percent. Let's look at some of those advanced, uh, ac advanced academic opportunities I mentioned early on. And specifically, I'm going to share with you all some information that we have available now. Do note that there will be a presentation or a letter date where we'll be sharing a deeper dive into advanced academics, IB, ACE, Cambridge, et cetera. That data is not currently available. But we do have data um, from last year for our CTE, early post-secondary opportunities in dual credit and in industry credentials. So if you look there in 2012 to 2013, we had one lone student, one student who earned a certification. Now these certifications can be your pipeline to your career. All right, you can graduate from high school earning $50,000, $60,000 a year with just your certification. But in this last year, we had 2,400 certifications earned. And know that in that, that 2,400, 50% growth in students who took and passed more rigorous um, certifications that employers were looking for. Also in this past year, you'll look at dual credit, 2012-2013, we had about 203 students who earned uh, or passed their dual credit exam. This past year, we were at 430. Now, look at your growth from 2020 to 2021. You had 329 students. The following year, you had 430. You're on a trajectory, if you increase that number alone, 100 students per year, then you're gonna double it in two years. We need to continue to grow the capacity for more students earning these early post-secondary opportunities. And I can tell you that even in certifications this morning, we. Um, got off a phone call worth a thousand additional students who are going to be earning CPR this year. So we're already on track to greatly exceed those numbers. Some highlights from this past year, community investment. What we do to gauge community investment is we look at time and talent. So when we look at our business partners, we want you to bring the expertise to train people like me who are afraid of flying about aviation. So we capture the investment that our community and partners make into each of our academies through a community investment, that calculated number, and you'll see growth from 2020 to 2021, and then also into 2001 to 2022. So we are seeing on average almost a half a million dollars that the community is investing in to supporting the work of the academies in each of those 12 schools. Another big win for us this past year was work-based learning. The learning and the earning that I've shared with you all. We had a goal of 15 students. We we're gonna have 15 students who are participating in career practicum. We actually went to 68. And of those 68 included students who were employed by Metro schools. 55 of those students completed um, the work-based learning practicum over the course of the year. We had 15 business partners this year. Note, we have 28 business partners. Our funding, we split. So we had uh, half, about half of our students receive their compensation and their pay and wages through WIOA, and other, our other 50% was those our employers paying students directly. I've given you a breakdown of just the demographics of our students who participated in the career practicum work-based learning this past year. And then we always look to celebrate the work that we're doing through um, Challenging ourselves to achieve the National Career Academy Coalition certification. I will tell you that each and every one of our academies have been certified through National Career Academy Coalition. Um, this past year, we had a total of nine, nine academies go through certification and continue. That is a very rigorous um, effort and it takes, a, a, it's renewed every five years. We took a deeper dive last year too. We said, we don't only want to look at the quality of each of our academies, but we want to hold ourselves to the quality of and accountability of our pathways within those academies. So we had 11 of our academies, I'm sorry, pathways go through Tennessee pathways. So now you've got academies that are national uh, nationally certified and the pathways within those academies that are certified. As of now, we have more, we being Metro Nashville Public Schools, have more certified pathways than any other district in the state. And then there is the fun stuff. 
In June, we were able to bring um, our so many of our, our teachers and leaders within our schools along with our partners together for our first AON conference. And we also brought back our in-person AON awards that we have not been able to do in person for quite some time. And what a celebration it was at Martin. We had hosted a two-day conference. And we really focused on taking a deeper dive, understanding that through turnover and through transitions and returning back from COVID, and et cetera, we sometimes need to be reminded of the great work that we're doing and also to re uh, hone in on that skill. So we focused a lot of our time in the summer around that teaching through the lens, that relevance in the classroom, strand one, along with our business partner engagement and how to engage being that strand three. And I'll show you a couple of highlights from the awards there. We had beautiful trophies, um, but it was a great event and we are excited and we'll continue doing that for quite some time. And then a uh, last big highlight I have for you all is we completed our 15th year of the Academies of Nashville last year. And as we did so, we wanted to go on a journey of not only um, looking at how we uh, continue our transformation, but also what does that look like? And so we went through a logo rebranding and this included input from our business partners, teachers, students, principals, and so forth. And you will see the new Academies of Nashville logo and how it might look at many of our schools across the district. Do I have time? Go for it. This I have is time. short. It's short. Okay. <laughs> All three of my children went to metro schools. My daughter, in the middle of her junior year, she transferred to Hillsborough because they had some advanced courses that at the time weren't available at Overton. And I was very proud of her. She graduated with two AP courses under her belt, so that gave her a boost going into college. But it still took her five years to get through college. She started with an engineering major, and then she realized, no, that's not for me. She went for a more applied math major, no, that's not for me. So then she graduated with communication major. Well, then she goes out, and she can't find a job in communication, so she takes a job as a receptionist for a physical therapy clinic, and then she realized, I want to be a physical therapist. If the academies had been in place in metro schools when she graduated, and they were not, she would have had the experience where she would have been able to explore the various majors. And it's funny, some of the criticisms that I've heard of the academies over the years, some parents have said, I don't think our children at age 15 are ready to choose a career. Well, they may not be, but they can explore and discover. And then by the time they get to college, they don't have to spin their wheels. If she had had that experience, I think she would have said, that's what I want to do. And I would have saved my husband and I a whole lot of money. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. my children. There we go. So let's tell you to where we're headed. Over the summer, we embarked on a journey to um, really start out strategizing what the next three-year strategic plan would look like for the Academies of Nashville and our commitment to accelerate the Academies of Nashville as we continue our transformation. We are accelerating that work in. And we went back to our roots and started with our executive principals, brought them all to the table. And they said, what is the work that's really going to help us to accelerate these academies of Nashville? And you'll see that identified through six theories of action, inspiring and equipping school teams, amplifying our success story, continuously improving our guiding principles, providing applied experiences, developing evidence of an MMPS ready grad, and creating an AON metrics of success. And so with our strategic planning, we have brought together each of our business partners, and it is a all-in community, much different than what we saw in 2006. Everybody is bought in. Everyone is helping to lead that work so that we can achieve our um, goals for over the next three years. So with that being said, Dr. Battle, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for that Academies of Nashville um, update. And um, Madam Shell, turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Cheryl? So I don't have any questions. I just uh, wanted to say kudos. I have, uh, I started out in 2009 as an Academies of Nashville business partner, and I have, it has been the best 
the best experience of my life. And I agree with the parent because my son went through the academies of Nashville. In two th he graduated from Antioch High School in 2011. And it saved me a lot of money because my, my children had an opportunity to, or my youngest son had an opportunity to experience the academies of Nashville. And he quickly learned what he didn't want to do. So that was huge for me. My daughter, who graduated a year before the Academy's model was introduced at, at her school, she was uh, so upset that she didn't get to go through that model and she was uh, jealous of my son. <laughs> so I agree and I will tell you from my personal experience, this is an absolute amazing program and I am so honored to be a part of it. And for anybody who has not experienced the academies, if you have not spent any time in the academies, please do so. And I hope to see everybody at the career fair. I'll be the one cheering the kids on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two technical questions. Can you explain dual credit um, for the audience who don't understand sure. what you meant by that in that chart? It sometimes can be a little confusing. We've got dual enrollment and dual credit. And uh, if you start with dual enrollment, it means I'm dually enrolled. I'm a, now a student of Metro Nashville Public Schools and a student of Nashville State Community College or somewhere else. Through dual credit, through my coursework, my standards, my scope and sequence that are taught in my classroom, I am meeting the criteria to earn college credit at one of our post-secondary. So for example, through my maintenance, uh, maintenance light repair course, I might have covered the same standards that are taught for credit at TCAT. So if I continue on only to TCAT, I can apply those credits towards my completion of the program. Great. And then what's WIOA? We are. Yes. Workforce Innovative Opportunity Act. Okay. I hope I got that right. I did. It sounds right. I, I, it was, you got to say it with confidence. Yes. Yes. Math. yes. <laughs> All right. Word for each letter. That's right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Tyler. Um, yes, I love the academies. I just, I mean, Dr. Bally, you and I have talked about this before. I've tried to, you know connect you with people that will help us expand our academies. And that is something that I still think that, you know, the more we can expand it, the more opportunities we can offer students that we don't currently offer them um, to keep them in school, keep them excited about it, and give them a pathway to true uh, citizenship in a way that is meaningful and, and that they're proud of. Um, I, I just am very excited about that. Um, that being said, I also know that it can sometimes be a struggle to find instructor, instructors who are willing to work for wages that would that are a lot less than they could make if they were working in their field doing that actual job as opposed to teaching high school students how to do it. Um, so how are we working to kind of combat that to make sure that we have enough um, instructors to fully staff our academies so that all of our students have these same kinds of great experiences? Yeah, I think um, the first thing is we've fortunately had lots of success um, this year in staffing um, with our um, academies. Um, we do have some strategies around how we um, place industry um, leaders um, on our pay scale. And so they do come in at step five. Hard to fill positions, yeah. I believe they are okay. step five. At least so we, we do kind of slot them in um, because we want to take that in consideration because there is a pay difference between being in industry and being um, in, in the classroom. That's why the investments in pay will also um, help with our recruitment efforts. And um, Jennifer, anything else you want to add to sure. specific strategies? To Dr. Battle's point, uh, we have out of 120 some odd uh, CTE positions, we have only two that are unfilled at this time. Um, among those, the hardest filled positions, uh, such as health science. Mm -hmm. um, so so as Dr. Battle mentioned, we do uh, have those on elevated. It, it is a community effort to fill these positions and think even in the uh, scope of, of health science where healthcare in, in general is uh, challenged by. So we really, uh, we really lie, rely on advocacy and support. So uh, for others to be the, that word of mouth of those opportunities. So we lean in a lot on our post-secondary institutions um, and with our partners to help us to bridge connections to those positions. Um, there is some advocacy uh, that can be done with the state level that wrote legislation 2020 passed that they would help pay for teachers earning those occupational license, but no guidance has come out on that. So there's an opportunity for us to continue to advocate for that work. Great. 
great. That's good to hear that we have plans and we're moving forward. And I love to hear that we only that we have almost fully staffed almost. our academies. That's amazing. Got to get to 100. Um, percent Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and then my last question is: Does every single high school have a freshman academy? Do a every zoned high school has a freshman academy? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Berthina. Thank you. Um, I have a. I'm a fan of the academies. I've seen the great work, um, been part of the inception um, of the academies working in high school. Um, however, I was on the campaign trail recently, and there's a lot of misperception in our community about um, the difference between vocational programs, CTE, and our academies. Would you mind clarifying that for us so that our community understands um, what they are? Sure. You go, and then I want to follow up with the personal story. I think it's really important. If you look at our theories of action, our strategic plan, one of the things that you'll see in there is a commitment around um, each of our, our, our founders thinking about pencil in the chamber and, and uh, metro schools and alignment is that we've got to be able to tell the same story. We need to be able to tell the story. And so it's important for us that we're going out, we're speaking about the academies, that we are speaking about, um, we don't use the terms vocational education. So we've got to be able to share that same language, that our students are completing a CTE pathway within their academy. And to be able to continue that, that, to share that message that the academies of Nashville, they are a transformation that are constantly con constantly evolving. And so I hope that kind of gets us started, and I think I'll, I'll let Dr. Battle take it from there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give a, a personal example. Being a graduate of Metro National Public Schools, John Ho Overton High School, to be specific. Um, <laughs> um, so I graduated before the academy's model was in MMPS, but I was fortunate enough that I knew my career path. I knew that I wanted to be a professional um, educator. In fact, that's why I attended John Overton High School, because they had a vocational program. Um, so I participated in the vocational program, and um, y'all have heard me talk about I had wonderful teachers and principals and counselors along the way. Everyone had a positive impact on me, regardless of the school I was in. Unfortunately, in my, in my experience in studying, getting prepared for post-secondary, and my passion to, to be a professional educator, the only person who knew that was my child care teacher. The only teacher who knew that, right? In our academy's model, you have a small learning community, a school within a school, where every teacher knows what your aspirations are, what you're exploring, what you may or may not learn you want to do in the future, and, and that's a great learning as well because that saves time, money, and energy once you get to post-secondary. But I was a principal of a high school that had a teaching as a professional academy. The difference in that vocational experience, which is, tends to be a standalone, is that you have a collective effort of teachers, counselors, administrators who are intentionally planning for this rigor for this relevance, um, the building the relationships, helping students create a deeper understanding of the profession or career that they're, they're interested in. Coupled with industry certifications, intentional dual enrollment and dual credit opportunities. So the difference tends to be a, spe a specified pathway of CTE courses that get you prepared as opposed to standalone vocational um, experiences. There is a space for that when you're thinking about, um, you know, sp specific professions um, and, and where they might work, but we're trying to create a model um, that deepens the experiences, that connects to not only the CTE pathways, but their content courses as well as we're preparing the whole student for their uh, post-secondary experiences. So that's that ten, tends to be how I uh, kind of separate <laughs> the two and what we have traditionally known as a vocational experience, which quite frankly, if you look back at the history, really tracked students. Um, and it's particularly in its early days um, and what we are envisioning in our ideal space around the academies of Nashville. Thank you. And just to just to clear that up from my perspective, um, we have a lot lot of people who in our community um, who went through Metro Nashville Public Schools or through Nashville Public Schools when they had vocational tech schools. Um, and so oftentimes they um, don't believe that we still have vocational programs or trade schools within a school, um, within our schools. And I just want to make sure that it's clear that every single high school has academies, um, which 
across um, Metro Nashville Public Schools, and that and that's the area that I think oftentimes um, people don't realize that are in our in our schools. And there, it's a great program. Um, it's a nationwide model um, that's being used across the country, um, and we really need to to tap in and see how we can support um, and really um, help increase the, the turnout um, and the support for students who go through that program. Yeah, I think um, a part of our um, strategic plan moving forward is about educating, bringing that awareness to um, our academies of, of Nashville um, model. Um, and for for those who are here and those who are watching and listening in, you know, you might not know that every year we have hundreds of leaders from across the country, um, even internationally, come to Nashville to study and learn about our academies of Nashville. Nashville model. So um, it is very well known. In fact, it might even be better known outside of Nashville for some odd reason um, because it is such a gem of a model to have right here in our very own schools. Four, 42 states and uh, four different countries have come to visit and learn what we are doing here today. So it's important that every one of our neighbors know what we're doing as well. And, and thank you. And the final question is just to clarify. Um, <laughs> Just to clarify, which high schools in Nashville and Metro Nashville Public Schools have academies? All 12 zoned high schools. All 12 zoned high schools. Yeah. Got it. And there's also a website? Yes. Okay. And Actually, what is that website that we can look it up to see academies, what academies, academies are? Academies of Nashville. But as a great resource is that any family can go to their child's uh, home school. Uh, website. So even if you go to your child's school, then you'll see all, each of the academies that are offered there and the courses within that and opportunities within that academy. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And follow us on Twitter, My Future, My Way. My Future, My Way. Yes. Thank you. Cheryl? Yes, I just have a follow-up question, uh, and this goes back to this goes back a couple of years, so things may have changed quite a bit, but I want to ask, uh, there was at one point a disconnect between uh, industry certifications as far as what the state approved and what we wanted to offer our students. And I say that because, uh, as you know, with business partners, things change in the, in the industry quite often, and sometimes those certifications that are approved by the State Board of Education don't always keep up with the current trends. So are we, are we in a better place now with uh, the State Board of Education in approving certifications uh, that are um, more current? Yes, I would say so. In addition to that, there's a system and structure in place now that allows us to submit requests for certifications to be to be approved. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Elena, please. Our newest school board member. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, um, how is each individual, like each school, I guess individual school, how are their academies chosen? Because... Um, I was just thinking like back to when I was transitioning to high school and I was looking at what schools offer, what academies. How how are we like ensuring that if I want to go into hospitality and I think Antioch has a cool hospitality academy, but I can't drive to Antioch every day, like how, I just I was just wondering how are those academies determined per community to make sure that everyone is able to go to Whatever That's a really great question. Yeah. And I, I do wish we could offer every academy at every yeah. school, but there's, there's a process to determining which academies and pathways will be offered at a school. And a lot of that is very much driven by um, industry demand, student interest in those academies. You have to look at um, the availability of the resources and partnerships to support those. And so what you might notice is if you look across our schools, I know I'm going to go use health science for just a moment, is in 10 of our schools. It's also one one of the most in-demand industries in our nation at this time. So all those factors taken in consideration. Um, we do have a school choice where a student can go to a school that may offer an, a, a, an academy or pathways that's not offered at their zone school. And we do recognize that transportation does pose challenges. And so we have been working with our local transportation systems to create, create better routes to allow students. But do know this, and this is what I constantly tell um, individuals is that the skills that you learn, regardless of which academy you're in, are transferable in all things that you choose to do. 
met a young lady recently who went into a, uh, she was in automotive um, academy pathway, and she was going into healthcare. And I asked her, I said, why did you do that? She said, because I could learn to use small instruments that were going to be applicable. And I learned how to work with others to solve problems. And so you can utilize those 21st century and those employability skills regardless of which academy or pathway you're in, and they will follow with you throughout life. Two um, additional things, our Pathways um, Academies tend to mirror South Side and North Side to um, increase access to um, the specific pathways, and this might be a good time to plug the investment um, of this board to continue with our STRIDE program for students and for all staff, which um, provides uh, no cost to students or um, staff members um, transportation through um, uh, the transportation, public transportation system. Thank you. Dr. Gentry. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of things I just want to highlight that HCA Healthcare has been significant in that expansion of the Health Sciences Academy's availability across Metro uh, The $70,000 grant that they just provided. Thank you very much. We'll get you some more. We'll get you some more. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and so the other thing I'll, I'll add to your question, uh, your, the comment is that it also is helpful when that industry partner can offer everything else that goes with being in the academy, not just the, the money, but the experiences, the job shadowing opportunities, the mentors and things of that nature. So all of that is what's taken into consideration when we consider the partner and what pathway we're able to offer. Um, I'll also say, and I really appreciate the last comment about this transferable skills. Uh, of the 9,000 jobs I have, one of them is as an adjunct professor at Tennessee State University, and I teach professional development for graduating engineering students. And one of the things I tell them when they're creating their resume is don't put your job description on there. Nobody cares. What are the skills? What are the skills you utilized or, or developed as a part of that role? So that's, that's an excellent point about the um, transferable skills. But my question is, do we get feedback, do we have a feedback loop from those industry partners? So students that we've sent to job shadow, students that we've sent there to even be employed, um, what is that feedback mechanism and can, is it possible to share sort of what they're seeing in our students and where we have opportunities to strengthen that's, that's a really great question. And to your point about that investment, that time and talent investment is priceless yes. because our students would not have those experiences if it weren't for our partners that were investing their time and talent into us. There is a, uh, for when we look at the feedback from our partners, there's a, a robust structure beginning with our partnership councils. We actually have an employability skills rubric that our employers use when our students are on the sites and also used in the classroom. It was created by partners for students, and so that's how we kind of track their progress to meeting some of those identified skills. Um, Secondly, is going to be the partnership councils that meet on a quarterly basis, and are, uh, those are facilitated by our Nashville Chamber, are represented by each of our partners, and, and is in those discussions that they um, give the feedback on what skills that students are lacking, that we take back then to our advisory board meetings that are occurring at the school level and implement and integrate the resources and supports that students need through that small learning community of the teaming. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Player, and then I'll close. I just want to kind of just piggyback on what Dr. Um, Nabal McKinney said, that the vocation school of yesteryear has evolved, mm -hmm. and so I think we need to make sure we are clear that what we think of traditional vocational schools are somewhat obsolete just because of the industry and the career has changed, where you look at computer science, where you look at technology, your classic woodworking skills is more of a niche artistic project compared to whether you do automotive or you do healthcare. And so I think when we go out and communicate the message of vocation, then that we are transforming it really for truly 21st century jobs that we're really in, and that we articulate that to the community, that our academies are a type of vocation, it's not the vocation that we are traditionally used to thinking of, that a lot of, a lot of our traditional vocation now requires, as you said, certification and technology, and that we're moving into the 21st century, and jobs to, to our academies reflects those, those industries and careers 
of the current times. And I think that's where a lot of the miscommunication comes from, is what we traditionally think from being Gen Xers and baby boomers compared to what millennials and Gen Xers are doing. So I think as we go and, and promote our, um, our schools and our academies, saying that this is the new level or the new type or the transformation, really, I want to say type, more transformation of, of vocational education, that it's totally different because the industries and the career require different expertise, different things, and it's not the traditional way. So we're not presenting it in a traditional way. And that new, the, the was it C, C and T, C and T, -E. C -T -E, thank you, is the new term for it. So I think we just have to translate the vocabulary that we are traditionally known for that what's act, that's acting now. Our academy's model for those watching and of course those in attendance is nationally recognized and it's well known across the entire nation. Though, and as Dr. Battle said, it's better known probably outside of Nashville, unfortunately, than it is with inside of Nashville. It is very common for myself when I speak to other districts within Nashville and especially within other uh, areas, whether it's part of Great City Schools or other communications that I might have with other boards and educational leaders, they always ask about the academy's model. And they they want to replicate it in some way or they would like to partner with us, they've come on a trip before. It is something for us to be exceptionally proud of and I know Jennifer you had some big shoes to fill when you took on this position and so I really appreciate this presentation and the incredible information you presented. I would like to ask that in the future if we have additional um, needs, particularly for the work-based learning, I know when we first discussed it in the spring, we've been able to expand it which I'm very excited about but at that time we had asked if we need additional partners to let us know as a board so we can best advocate for that. So if that's a continued need or want for expansion, um, please let us know so we can use our um, relationships, whether it's with the Chamber of Commerce or any other group, um, so we can expand that and continue all this great work. I really appreciate that. It was exceptionally thorough and I'm very excited that everyone here and also watching could see all the good work that we're doing both in reward and in academies. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one thing? Could we repeat the um, career fair dates? Oh, it's November 8th. Thank you. I just want everybody to be aware. Yes. And we'll mention it again and we'll mention it several times, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else, Dr. Bell? That'll be all. Thank, Thank you. you. I um, so appreciate the people that have stuck around for public participation. I know that it is later than usual, and you have been so generous to wait with us. Um, I hope that you have found your time here with us to be beneficial, and that you are, you are proud of your elected officials for being vigorous and thorough with their questions. Um, what we're going to do for public participation, in case you've not been here before, as I see some new faces, is you have three minutes to speak. You will see the names of people listed here. We have about 12 on this list. What I'm going to ask you to do, in case you have been here before, this is a little bit new, so I'm going to start asking people to queue up. So if you're one of the first three people, if you'll get in line, so one, and then two, and three, and then if you'll kind of watch that, so we can go ahead and go through that. When you have your three minutes, you'll know what your time is because there's a timer on the side. You can see it says three minutes already over here to your right. And at the end of that three minutes, you'll hear our beautiful bell. Who has that bell? Ding. Thank you. <laughs> we, it, it's, we're, we're almost to Price is Right level. Almost, guys. <laughs> so at the end of that, you will hear yours. <laughs> Ooh, so uh, I so appreciate y'all sticking around. So if we will first start with number one, uh, Maxwell, if you are here, and then two, Anna, and three, Daniel, if you'll go ahead and get in line so we can get started. So first person, oh, I should also say, you do need to tell us your name. You do, need, you do not need to tell us your address. That has sometimes been a question in the past because this is a public forum. We would really appreciate it if you know uh, what your district is, if you would tell us that information, that would be so helpful. But you do not need to give us your address since it is a public forum. So the first person is Maxwell. And if that person is not here, we'll go with Anna. And then number three, it sounds like you're it, Daniel. Okay, you first. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> All right. Um, and I just came up here because I wanted to say uh, thank you. I was here for the uh, Grow Your Own recipient uh, a couple Tuesdays ago. So to the Board of Education, a simple thank you cannot express my level of gratitude for all the opportunities I have been granted as an MMPS employee. By the way, I'm Daniel Schuess from uh, Neely's Bend Elementary. 
<laughs> From starting off as a para pro to becoming a tutor, to becoming a resident teacher, to now being the third grade English teacher at Neely's Bend Elementary, I have been able to grow exponentially in four short years. Particularly, the Grow Your Own grant allowed me to work towards my goal of becoming a teacher without having to worry about keeping afloat financially. So while my words may fail to express how grateful I truly am, I must say to everyone here and everyone who has played a part uh, in getting me where I am today from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Do you have, hold on, we don't want to take away his time, guys. <laughs> it's okay. I owe a great deal of thanks specifically to the staff and students at my school, Neely's Bend Elementary. My coworkers have offered me so much guidance while, their student, while our students have shown me exactly how fulfilling trading knowledge can be. Together, we all live up to our motto of setting a standard in the Northwest. However, this year we have adopted a mindset of continuing our shift to better. And this idea is what inspired me to speak tonight. We want to give our students at Neely's Bend every opportunity to be, every opportunity to be successful. And programs like STEAM would help us do just that. Between the addition of fifth grade and the rapid growth in our community of Madison, we have gained many new learners and diverse interests this year. And we are dedicated to serving all of their individual educational needs. Please help us in offering our students as many opportunities as I've been granted. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess number four is Sark, and then after that's five, Nicole, and six, oh, Council Member Hancock. So first, Sark. Thank you. Hello, Chair and members of the board. My name is Sark Asadorian, and this is my first time speaking, so I'm a little nervous, but. Um, I I'm, I'm go to Hillsboro, I'm a senior, and I'm in District 8. So my biology teacher, Dr. Anderson, had resigned recently because she found a new job. She left on her own fruition, and after working five years to share her knowledge with us, many students were very touched and saddened that she left. Dr. Anderson focused on, is a person focused on altruism in her life. One moment that sticks out to me is when she told us about how she opened her house up to a formerly incarcerated man who lived with them for many years till he could find his own home. When I got the email of her resignation after she was out of class for having COVID, I was unable to say, I was very sad because I was unable to say goodbye and I was grieving that I was no longer being, going to be taught by somebody I admired. I didn't know what to do with my feelings so I turned to my mom for some advice. She suggested a going away party and I really like that idea. Me and Dr. Anderson emailed back and forth and we agreed upon that she would come during school, during lunch, so we could easily say goodbye to her. The day before, I checked my email and saw a message from Dr. Anderson. Through the vice principal at her school, she was informed per our principal Dr. Pelham's orders, she was not able to say goodbye to us at school grounds. Me and my classmates were angry. Why were we not allowed to say goodbye to a teacher that had worked, for, worked with us to get us summer internships and prepare us for the IB tests? The district talks about social emotional learning as being a priority, but if you really want to truly prioritize social emotional learning, I think it's important to allow students to say goodbye to the teachers that really matter in their lives. I hope this story connects with you, members of the board, and I hope you move to implement rules and guidelines to, to make sure that teachers can say goodbye to their students. Um, I'm gonna send you an email following up with my points and I hope we're in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nicole. Okay. Council Member Hancock. Your jerker right before me. <laughs> um, I'd appreciate it if you might wave the three minutes. I won't be super, super long, but I did have Council Lady, Councilwoman Porterfield here with me. She had to leave because um, of our long meeting, and I do have a um, gift for all of you from the entire Metro Council. So hopefully that mm -hmm. will help it spend my time. Um, we actually passed a resolution in support of Metro National Public Schools' full implementation of sustainable practices throughout the school district. I, um, in a concentration of everyone's time, narrowed this down to a top 10 list to be fun, like Dave Letterman. So, um, <laughs> 
10, whereas children who develop a positive relationship with nature are more likely to become tomorrow's stewards of our natural heritage. Children who have safe access to these public outdoor spaces are more resilient, and all children should feel welcome at all of National Davidson County's parks, pools, zoos, nature centers, trails, waterways, and other open spaces. Let every student be known. Nine, whereas all communities that have access to nature experience educational, emotional, and physical benefits. Communities in disadvantaged areas receive even greater benefits from nature through improved health equity, lower rates of mortality and disease, and increased food security as families gain knowledge and ability to grow and preserve fresh food for themselves. And eight, whereas Nashville Public Schools is confident that through these forward steps, it can help the metropolitan government of Nashville and Davidson County achieve its goals for our city to reach zero waste, a reduced carbon footprint, and increased tree canopy. And seven, whereas Metro Nashville Public Schools has the potential to make positive, tangible environmental change in Nashville and Davidson County by teaching students to be stewards of their local and global communities, the earth, and its resources. And six, whereas Metro Nashville Public Schools has seen that when students experience a culture in their schools that is rich in sustainability, outdoor education, and social emotional learning, they experience and benefit from dramatic academic improvement are more confident, better problem solvers, more creative, and become involved local citizens. And five, whereas Metro Nashville Public Schools is working to develop and implement a systemic framework to coordinate these efforts and improve student learning and involvement as the student's district's culture moves to one of sustainability. And four, whereas the mayor has created a sustainable advisory committee consisting of people within the city, government, environmental community, and school district to map out the path that Metro Nashville Public Schools can take to implement sustainable practices and work to support the city sustainable goals. And three, whereas MNPS has shown that moving towards sustainability will benefit our community in many ways, not the least of which is good stewardship of taxpayers' monies and resources. And two, whereas the Metro Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights has been personalized to Nashville and Davidson County using the Tennessee Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights, examples from other cities, and suggestions by Metro, Metro Nashville Public School students to include every child has a right to ride a bike, splash in a creek, fish in a pond or stream, hike a trail or walk in the woods, enjoy a campfire and make s'mores, camp under the stars, discover plants and animals in a park, explore nature, play in the mud, hug an old tree, plant a tree, jump in a pile of leaves. So therefore, be it resolved that the Metro Council goes on record as congratulating and endorsing Metro National Public Schools for their work to implement sustainable practices, including outdoor education throughout the district, and strongly encourages a continuation of these efforts. It was introduced by Tanya Hancock, Tom Dreffel, Bob Nash, Berkeley Allen, Delisha Porterfield, Angie Henderson, Zulfat Sorara, Emily Benedict, and was passed unanimously by Metro Council. Thank you so much for hearing me. I got to see most of you yesterday. I'm so glad to see you again. And I just have to shout out to District 9, Council District 9, that um, all three of the elementary schools in District 9, Amqui, Neely's Bend, and Smith and Craig's Head all got reward school status, so that's pretty awesome. And I'm in Emily Masters School District 3. So does anyone want to distribute? You'll Thank give you them so to Dr. Much. Sabir. Thank you for your time. I appreciate all you guys are doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Paul. Paul Prill. Hi, I'm in District 2, and I voted for you. Oh. <clears throat> Just so you know. <laughs> My name is Paul Prill. I'm a retired faculty member from Lipscomb University, and now a certified master gardener and a board member of Wild Ones of Middle Tennessee. Hypothetically, what would happen to Nashville tomorrow if 70% of the restaurants and 50% of the grocery stores disappeared? If tomorrow 40% of the housing became uninhabitable? The economic and social chaos which would ensue is unthinkable. Without food and habitat, people would either flee the city or succumb to the stress of trying to live here. For hundreds of thousands of insects, birds, and mammals in Davidson County, this hypothetical is a daily reality. 
Urban infill paves over or builds on land which used to offer wildflowers and native grasses, food and habitat for all these creatures. What green space remains features mostly monocultures of corn or wheat or soybeans in the area farms or monocultural manicured lawns of fescue or Bermuda grass in the city. As Nashville continues to develop, the city has worked to buffer that development with new city parks, greenways, and bicycle paths for humans to enjoy some quiet spaces and experience nature in the city. Unfortunately, we haven't thought to create at the same time corridors of food and habitat for wildlife migration and survival. I know that students need places to play outdoors, <coughs> but schoolyards can serve a dual purpose. The Green Schoolyard Movement shows, how, shows us how to reimagine these spaces for native gardens and play spaces that encourage students to love nature. The Tennessee Smart Yards program teaches students and staff about how communities work together to keep our soil healthy, our water clean, and our wildlife thriving. Even a 100 to 200 square foot meadow or pocket prairie could provide nutrition and habitat for insects and birds. Evidence of the effectiveness of these spaces is clear in Tennessee, other parts of the United States, and on every continent. The United Nations said declared this the decade of ecosystem restoration. We must use all our available green, uh, available green spaces, all of our great available green spaces, to replace what has been lost, which right now in Tennessee is 30% of our songbirds, 80% of our monarch butterflies, and 50% of bumblebees and native bees. We're at the precipice of losing so much more than just a few acres of grass. We pass up the opportunity to involve students in appreciating, preserving, and restoring the natural world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Richard. Richard Hitt. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Battle, Chair Elrod, and other members of the board. My name is Richard Hitt. I'm a retired math professor. And um, I'm here representing the Middle Tennessee Chapter of Wild Ones. For those of you who don't know what Wild Ones is, it's a national nonprofit organization that supports the use of native plants in the landscape, as Dr. Perel was saying, because of the benefit it provides in support of biodiversity. I'm going to get less muffled for you. Um, of our 150 members in Wild Ones, 80, 80 reside in, in Davidson County. So I'm here to speak in support of outdoor education as a means to improve learning, improve health, and even improve test scores, standardized test scores. There are literally hundreds of research papers and studies which, which support this. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation has an excellent 40-page booklet on these topics called Back to School, Back Outside. At the recent in-service training for Metro teachers, I was privileged to meet 25 teachers, science teachers from the native, from the uh, national schools. And we, we had, I was in the sustainability branch of that. And we were um, interested in talking with them. And one thing I picked up from them is they're interested in having some sort of outside training facility, whether it's a pollinator garden or an arboretum type space where they can take their students, change the mood, and that's part of the outdoor education movement uh, that we're talking about. The um, teachers didn't seem to have a connection with the metro schools in terms of finding a way to fund these projects. And so for the pollinated gardens, I mentioned the Wild Winds Grant Program for Seeds for Education, and some of these teachers in intended to apply for that. For the tree program, I mentioned the National Tree Bank, or the Metro Tree Bank, which is a, a beautiful source of funds for adding trees to public spaces like schoolyards. Um, I lead a group of volunteers that maintain the uh, native gardens at Westmead Elementary School, so each week I get to go out there, experience the native plants. We've documented 32 species of pollinators just in the past season uh, that live there and use, use the native plants for resources. And it's a wonderful education opportunity that would allow students to connect what they learn in the classroom with something they can see in their yard. They don't have to go on a school trip to Warner Parks, they can just walk out in the schoolyard and experience this on a daily basis and see the changes over time. Um, so to, to sum this up, let me just say that guided learning about nature 
helps us all appreciate the complexity of nature's food web. This appreciation is, <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, next is Karen McIntyre. I think all the people who are here in the building, number one, should stand up. And I think you should present them with a certificate because they now know a great deal about how Metro schools operate. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them have already gone home because you this do. was a really long, wonderful, informative meeting. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a librarian and a storyteller, and I'm going to tell you a story. I love folk tales. And this is a Nasruddin story. It's from the Sufi tradition. And Nasruddin is kind of like coyote in Native American stories. Nasruddin's wife was preparing the evening meal. Nasruddin was practicing kamancha in the living room. A kamancha is kind of like a lute, only it uses a bow. And as he was practicing, it sounded sort of like this. And his wife came in and said, Nasruddin, why in the world all the other men in the village practice Kamancha all up and down the fretboard? They make beautiful notes. Why are you playing this one note? Nasruddin looked at her and said, those other men, they're all looking for this note. <laughs> we'll be here every month to present the same note, maybe in a different octave, or maybe, maybe even a different variation. Tonight, we're talking about outdoor education for children. And each time we come, we present you with a document, which you'll get electronically tomorrow, and you can click on the links to see all the 147 studies that Dr. Hitt mentioned. What I want to say tonight is that as I listened to all the wonderful presentations, I thought, we fit in there, and we fit in there, and we fit in there, but I don't have time to tell you where all those places are. Nor had I thought about adding up all the money we save you. <laughs> nine hours a week of gardening from Miss Dr. Hitt and his crew, nor all the wonderful benefits that we provide in terms of public support for the schools. This is a, something that was begun in the Westmead Garden. We had a Waffles for Westmead, and people came, and Dr. Hitt took the, them through the gardens, and we had about 40 people who decided they wanted to start restoring wildlife in their yards. And I thought, gosh, we'll start a Facebook group. If we get 25 people, it'll be great. We have 476 people in this group after a year. It's an active group. They communicate all the time about how to do this. And they have a positive impression of our schools. I'm a huge supporter of public education. But we need your support, because without it, it makes our jobs almost impossible, even though we continue to do them. Thank you. Next is Lynn Woodward. Lynn? Okay. Next is, oh, past council member, Charlie Tiger. Please don't hold that against me. I will not. <laughs> Chair Lady Elrod, my school board member, Abby Tyler, rest of the board, thank you for allowing me to be here. It's been 32 years since I've been here. The first time I came as a new, newly elected council member, not understanding all the nuances, I came to tell Mr. Henson how to spend money more wisely. <laughs> that didn't work too well. I come here tonight, though, as the grandparent of two current MNPS students and a third one that's now a sophomore at Ohio State in pre-veterinary school, talking about the tremendous education that my kids, grandkids are receiving. When you get to my age, I'm often asked questions like, what legislation did you sponsor that you're most proud of? Well, I had the opportunity to create the Greenway system in Nashville, which is unbelievable for a council member looking back on that, because you, know, you all realize most things happen in the mayor's office, but that was something the Metro Council did. 
they said, what was the most impactful legislation? Well, I was chosen to speak in 1993 in the Bredesen administration as the only speaker in favor of the controversial Bridgestone Arena, the Nashville Arena. What a difference our city is because of that and the impact on tax revenues and whatnot. But today I hear I'm coming to tell you about the most important thing I've done in my political career. And that was the Bellevue Middle School Edible Learning Lab. Modeled after the edible schoolyard in Berkeley, California, Alice Waters' vision and impact. Dr. Hargis had become Bellevue Middle School principal. Uh, her first day was July 1st, 2009, and we were on a plane going to Berkeley to visit that wonderful prototype garden. But I'm gonna give you just one suggestion. And I was gonna use the pun, I'm gonna plant the seed with you. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll throw that in. My experience having visited dozens of gardens and outdoor classrooms in, throughout Nashville in my political career, without the funding, if we as a community have decided that supplements to teachers to coach to be a band teacher, to be a cheerleading sponsor is important to our community. Surely a supplement for a teacher in the school to be a garden manager or a liaison to the community. You've seen dozens of instances of volunteers that are here ready to make this happen. But where the lack is, is when teachers transfer, somebody will have an idea, they'll start a garden. Two years later, that teacher transfers, and the next thing you know, you have a weed pile there. If there was a supplement created, talk to your council members. Let's get this done. It, it's there to, to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last is Michelle Sheriff. I won't play a video, although I apologize for interrupting earlier, but it was an MMPS celebration video that popped up on Instagram. <laughs> Um, greetings, Chair Elrod, Vice Chair Player, um, the rest of the board, and Dr. Battle. As you know, I'm Michelle Sheriff and President of Metro National Education Association. I'm not here speaking about sustainability, but I was at Bellevue with the garden, and at HG Hill, we had a sustainability program there as well. So we are pro sustainability. Um, on behalf of MEA officers, board of directors, and our members, we want to congratulate our newly elected board members. We look forward to working with you and continuing our relationship with um, existing board members. And welcome to our new student member, and welcome back, Ebenezer. It's good to see you back. Um, we just want to recognize, first of all, the hard work of the district and celebrate with you with being an advancing district. We know last year was we heard harder than the previous year with COVID. So it was a lot of hard work from a lot of people and we wanna celebrate that with you. And just highlight a few things this year that we want to work on and partner with through our MOU committees, which um, at the district is part of, we're part of, and the board. And compensation committee, we want to work on the longevity pay for teachers, similar to what administrative pay has, metro government, state um, uh, employees have. Retention committee focusing on ways to retain teachers, policies that will do that. Um, one thing that has been a big issue this past year was the transfer process. So we wanna work on improving that. We've already uh, talked with HR about that. And I think we're in agreement on that. Um, and then, you know, just keeping our teachers, experienced teachers, supporting our new teachers so that they stay within the district. Um, one thing that we're hearing a lot of, and you've heard some t talk of this before, is the COVID leave policy. And so we've heard, you know, that COVID is similar to other illnesses, that we want to align it with a student policy, but other illnesses do not have a mandatory isolation period as COVID does. And if students are out, 
um, and have to do isolation, they're not in danger of loss of pay as teachers might be. So teachers get 10 sick leave days per year. That's two COVID isolation periods. So we wanna make sure that teachers are not losing pay out of no fault of their own. And then the last thing is we're still working on some teachers who haven't been paid or paid correctly. And so we're passing those over to HR. We know there's been some extenuating circumstances, but we would love to see a plan for how this will not happen in the future. And so we just stand ready to continue partnering and working with you all and the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Thank you to everyone that um, provided public participation and signing up. If you have additional information that you would like to provide us, you're of course always welcome to email us. And if you are interested in participating in a future public participation, that is all on our board member website, which is mnps.org backslash board of education, um, where you can find that information to uh, sign up the Monday before that action. Um, next is going to be our consent agenda. So we have adopted the agenda as listed. Now may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move the rule over the consent agenda as listed. Second. Thank you. So the approval has been first and seconded. All in favor here on the board, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Lastly, we have committee reports. We had one committee meeting before this five o'clock meeting. That was at 4.30 and it was our capital needs meeting. Uh, Ms. Tyler, who is the chair of that, will you please give us a brief summary of what was said and done? Uh, yes, we just had a presentation on some of our properties that are not being utilized right now and how we can best, um, the ideas of our group about how to best use these spaces that we have and their recommendations. Um, no action was needed at that time, but it, it just wants to get it on everybody's radar. Thank you. And those are all publicly available as well for the public viewing or those in the audience. If you want additional information, of course, you could always reach out to us, but that information is also available so you can see what those properties are if you're interested. All right, now it's time for everyone's favorite point, announcements. Um, in the past, we have gone around in the U shape. I would like for us to start going by district number. So that would mean Dr. Gentry goes first. Um, and then we'll skip over me as I'll go last. So it'll go for me and then on to District 3 to Abigail. All right, so thank you, um, Chair Arrowrod. I just wanna again congratulate the entire district uh, for the work. Uh, when Dr. Battle uh, called to, to share the, the news and we talked about it and we talked about the journey specifically for District 1 uh, that got us to where we are today. It did, oh, Aaron was crying. I wasn't crying, it was Aaron. <laughs> Aaron cried, <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, but yeah, I cried before I got here. <laughs> uh, it, it was hard. It was, it was some very tough decisions had to be made uh, to get us where we are today specifically. And I'm selfishly speaking about District 1. Um, and those of you who were here, you know. It wasn't pleasant, <laughs> it was ugly. Uh, so I just wanna thank everybody, um, the teachers, the staff, and, and just as Dr. Battle indicated, everyone who had a hand in pushing and pushing and pushing and being very clear about what success looked like, being uncompromising about what success looked like, being uncompromising about uh, uh, not letting certain, sub, um, certain student groups um, slide or get a pass uh, and not having to meet the same expectations. And so I personally want to thank you. I could literally go home right now and never come back. Like I literally, this could, this could be the period on my career as a school board member. Honestly, it could. And I, I can't thank uh, you all enough for that. I also want to just highlight my shirt again in case anybody missed what it says. It says to all the ladies in the place, sorry, Ebony. <laughs> Got you with them. <laughs> 
Hold on. <laughs> Give me a minute. Okay. All right. To all the ladies in the place with style and grace, I ordered this shirt in anticipation of this board looking exactly the way it looks today. So I am excited um, to serve uh, at least the next two years uh, with you all. And this meeting is any indication of the attention, of the concern, of the engagement. Um, we're in for some long meeting, but <laughs> other than that, <laughs> Dr. Battle, I think you have the team that you need. And I said this to you on election night, call, well, and I wasn't even in the country, but I said this to you on election night that uh, this is the time. This is it right here. This is how we keep these schools who've exited priority status off of that list. This is how we keep making more reward schools. This is how every student, every teacher, every staff member is known. This is how we get PTOs in our schools. This is how we get the students the resources that they need. This board right here. Thank you. Thank you. District 3. Thank you. I just want to um, echo that congratulations to our new board members um, and to Elena, our new student board member. Um, and I'm just, I'm excited to be working with, with everyone. I also want to say I have a freshman in a freshman academy and um, can echo so much of what has said. It is so unique and knowing that he is is going to go through and that the He's going to have repeat of the same teachers, and, and once he gets on a certain path, he's going to be with a lot of the same students. And I think, you know, in a school with, with 1,500 students, which is where he is, um, that's exciting for me as a parent to know that he's going to have sort of that that experience. So I just want to throw that little personal note in about the Academy's model. And it is, it's high school. It's all the high school things, plus, 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 plus. So... Um, that's it. District 4. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be back on the board um, for the, uh, with you all for the next four years. Um, I do want to publicly thank um, everyone who played a part in my election to the board. It took a whole community and a whole team to help get us there, and I am really honored, humbled, and grateful um, for everyone's um, part in that. Couple of announcements. Um, it's been a busy um, month, uh, so I do want to recognize Stanford Montessori. Um, their beta club had an installation and honor ceremony for their um, they, uh, their beta club, which are fourth grade students, uh, did a buddy bench. And the buddy bench was to increase participation and friendship among uh, students within the school. Um, and so that was a very honorable project and very compassionate project for those fourth grade students. Um, I wasn't able to participate today, but my son was also inducted into the beta club today and they had their ceremony. So I missed it, um, but so happy for him and, and, and excited for all the children who will be participating this year. Um, second, congratulations to our two McGavick High School educators, uh, Angela, Adam, uh, Angela Allen and Laura Vignon, who were recognized at the Nashville Public Education Foundation um, Public Schools Hall of Fame ceremony um, last week as, it's, as inspiring educators for their work to improve college access uh, for high school students. Um, secondly, I, I want to wish congratulations to all of our reward schools, all of our schools who came off of priority lists, but a special recognition to my uh, District 4 schools, um, which are Dodson Elementary and Strive Collegiate Academy as reward schools. Um, and then lastly, um, I just want to welcome uh, Elena Mitchell to our board as our new student board member, and I am excited to work with with all of my new colleagues on the board. I think we're gonna have a fantastic year. Um, we have a lot of work to do and I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. District five to dis district six. <laughs> Awesome. So I uh, also echo Dr. Berthina's uh, sentiments. I'm excited to be back. I feel like I'm home. 
So I'm excited to be back working with some amazing uh, individuals. And yes, it's going to be a great women-led board because we've got one of the best directors of school in the country, and we've got a fantastic board of education. So I'm excited to be back here. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, on Saturday, September 17th, and this is for any student in Metro Schools who is interested in a U.S. Service Academy nomination, a congressional nomination, U.S. Service Academy Day will be held at the Downtown Public Library uh, Saturday, September 17th from 9 a.m. to noon. Uh, you do not have to register in advance, but you do have to show up and, you know, kind of be there and participate. There will be Service Academy members from uh, West Point, Air Force, um, Navy, all of the branches will be there for any student who is seeking a, a Congressional Academy nomination. Also, District 6 first community meeting will be held on next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. That's September 20th. We will be at the Southeast Library in the large community room, and these will be monthly meetings that will be held between board meetings. So please come out to that. Uh, some great news for our Antioch High School athletic program. Uh, MAPCO at, the, at 3800 Murfreesboro Road just opened uh, this past week. And as a um, way of giving back to the community, they are dedicating two pumps to our Antioch High School athletic program. And basically what that means is if you purchase your gas from one of these two pumps, 25 cents per gallon will be donated to the Antioch High School athletic program. So go to the MAPCO at 3800 Murfreesboro Road and look for the pumps. And just because I've been there twice already, it's pump 15 and 16. <laughs> um, so, and uh, that way our schools get that support. And finally, J.E. Moss, is holding their College and Career Week, the week of September 26th, and also uh, their Multicultural Festival will be October 6th from 5.30 to 7. And a big congratulations to both Lakeview Elementary and J.E. Moss Elementary for being on the rewards list. I'm a proud District 6 representative. I love all my schools, and we're going to just kick it. It's going to just go out of the park. So congratulations to every single one of our reward schools. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. District 7. Um, I just want to just recognize that 9-11 has passed. I was in Washington, D.C. when that happened. I'm in grad school, so um, that's a very special, not special. Um, <laughs> Particular time, yes, as being being that and what it did to our country that we don't forget um, this what happened and just want to take a time just to recognize that moment. Also, give my condolences to my Fisk family um, and to the national community for Dr. Paul and Kwame's passing. Um, this is the second time that someone that's literally part of the soundtrack of my Fisk career has passed away. He's a former church member also, and what he's done for the impact for the Fisk community and for the Nashville and the country with the um, Fisk. Jubilee Singers and the legacy that he's had over the last 30 years. So I um, want to recognize that. Um, congratulations to um, Glendary and Whitsitz Elementary Schools in my district for becoming a reward school. So very proud about that. Um, also, Hispanic Heritage Month starts this week. So um, Plaza Mariachi and Casas Friends in my district. Um, and so just to the Hispanic community, um, we just congratulate you and celebrate the upcoming month that's coming this way. And then also, um, um, when I first got appointed to the board, it was the first time we came an all-female um, body uh, with Dr. Battle. And then now, this is the first duly elected school board, all women school board. So I think it's something that we should mark this occasion that all of us have been duly elected by the people of, of Nashville, Davidson County, and I am expecting wonderful and great things uh, from this. And then also, um, just want to congratulate and give a good job to Dr. Battle. Um, she has been a wonderful leader and really promoted all the teachers and principals principals and executive uh, principals about we're making reward status, but that doesn't happen with a great leader. And I think we need to take this time to really acknowledge 
in these three short years, I think we came on a board maybe literally months apart, <laughs> and that what you have done in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of national disasters, um, economic downturns, and back up, that what your leadership has done in your short tenure to make the record progress and reward schools and taking on fraud should not go unnoticed, unrecognized, and that it takes a great leader to do that. And I know you're going to uplift your team, and they deserve to do that, but you also personally deserve kudos because you have gone through some personal hell also to get here, <laughs> but it has not gone noticed, and we are so glad that you are a leader here and that we're going to have you, hopefully for a very long time, if I have anything to do with it, uh, money would not be an issue. <laughs> 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 if I can say anything else about it, but I just want to make sure that you get the kudos for your leadership, for what you've done to get us to the record reward status that we have and to um, get us out of the priority schools, the limited amount of priority schools that we have due to that stupid th lack of threshold. But anyway, that's another <laughs> thing. Um, but thank you for your service. Thank you. Mr. Date? I was prepared to clap there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> clap, but I didn't hear one, and then I figured I would just go ahead and do it. So, um, um, I, uh, this is obviously being my very first board meeting um, as a board member. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, super excited. Um, Want to thank, um, as uh, Dr. B did, everyone who helped uh, support our campaign and effort to get here, um, especially my family. Um, but also, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be. I, the number of times we've talked about um, this board and the women and women-led, um, but also um, I've, I've just been very impressed with the kinds of questions and attention that I've heard uh, everyone give tonight. So much so that I had to stay really quieter than I wanted to, didn't ask as many questions I want to, so everyone can expect to hear more questions from me and um, hopefully won't get Sharon you know, too much longer on meetings, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm thrilled to be here and, and be part of uh, be part of this. And I also want to just give a quick shout out um, to the woman who used to occupy this seat, Jeannie Poopa Walker, for the excellent job that she did um, and her, her mentorship as I, um, as I take on this role. So quick um, announcements. Uh, Waverly Belmont had a choir performance today on the steps of the uh, City Hall, is that correct? Um, as part of the Music Makes Us performance. Um, and the, uh, if you don't know her, the music teacher there, her name is Alice Wally. She is a fantastic human being and an amazing teacher uh, who has done an incredible job, won multiple awards. Um, and so really excited for them and that performance that occurred today. Um, thrilled to be sharing board seats with uh, a student from a high school that mm -hmm. is represented by District 8, um, Elena, so I'm glad to have you here and the two of us can, as the newest people on this board, hopefully hold each other up. Um, and um, want to, uh, just as everyone else has, congratulate the reward schools in District 8, Aiken Elementary, Glendale Elementary, JT Moore Middle, where my kids go, um, Julia Green, Percy Priest, Sylvan Park, and West End. Super proud of all of those schools and it was great to see all the principals here tonight. Um, I will also be holding uh, District 8 uh, community meetings monthly, same date and time, so we'll probably be doing similar things here. So uh, next week, September 20th, um, hopefully at the Green Hills Library, um, and I'll put more information about that online. So I'm um, thrilled to be here. Thanks, everybody, for, for your support getting here. Thank you. District 9. Um, I also want to congratulate our reward schools, specifically for District 9. Um, Harpeth Valley Elementary and Charlotte Park Elementary and Early College High School. So I'm very proud of them and all of our reward schools and all of our schools that are continuing to move forward, period. So very, very proud of all of our schools um, as they've slogged through these last several years. Um, yeah. I will also be available for a community meeting this Saturday, September 17th at 10 a.m. Um, Gloria Hauser's, Councilwoman Gloria Hauser's having a meeting for District 22 that I will be presenting at. If you would like to come and learn a little bit more about MMPS schools, I'll be there. And i um, happy to answer any questions and interact with anybody who comes. It'll be at the Ford Ice Center at 10 a.m. Um, on September 17th, this Saturday. So I will also make sure that that's available online. Thank you. Bertha, you had it in. Absolutely. Um, then we will do our students. So Abenezer, if you will go, please. And then Ms. Elena. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start off by, again, congratulating the 44 awards, reward schools that, that were congratulated today with us. 
um, especially very special to me because I saw all three of my schools here from elementary to high school. And it's a really incredible like feeling to see my old middle school principal who I haven't seen in almost five years come up to me, give me a hug, and, and I have the chance to, you know, dap them up and everything, and it's just a really, really, really <laughs> nice feeling. Um, I also want to congratulate and welcome Elena for, for joining us on the board. She's going to be here for the next two years. She's going to be taking up my spot next year, too, and it's, it's very nice to see someone who, who's a good representation of what the district can offer. And then lastly, I just um, want to bring up the fact that the district offered ACT is coming up for seniors in the beginning of October, so to all seniors, you know, get to study. This is a very, very incredible chance to take the ACT for for free and at school, and it's something that we should all be using. Thank you. And Elena. Okay, hi. Um, I want to firstly thank everyone for welcoming me. Um, this has been a very fun meeting. <laughs> um, so yeah, just want to say firstly thank you guys for having me, and I'm very excited for what the future holds. Um, I also want to congratulate all the reward schools. Um, shout out to Robert Churchwell for their priority school exit, because that is my elementary school. Um, and then lastly, I just want to highlight that it is fall sports. So go and support your MMPS athletes, and not just the football team, but also girls volleyball, girls soccer, cross country, golf, cheerleaders. We don't compete, but we are a sport. Um, and yes, just go support. And our elementary school, they have, they have soccer and cross country and all those things too. So support our students. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Berthina. Yeah, a couple of things I forgot to mention. Um, yesterday I attended the College and Career Fair that was held at the Southeast Community Center. It was a great event um, hosted by our counseling department. Um, and so it was great experience for the many of students that were um, participating in that event. Um, and it was great turnout. And so I really appreciate that the district is doing it um, and providing that opportunity for students across our community. Um, and then the last thing is I want to get a shout out to um, Renita Perry and uh, Sharika Roby Grant. Um, I was able to attend the Tennessee Charter Commission hearings um, on uh, last week sometime, both days. Um, <laughs> yeah, Thursday, no, when, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday some days next week, last week. Um, but it was a great example. I, I recommend that all of our board members take an opportunity to go to those hearings, to see what occurs in those hearings. I will say that um, Sharika Roby Grant and Renita Perry were rock stars in representing our district um, and representing the facts um, uh, for our district and in those charter school hearings. Um, so it's really important that each one of you take a moment to attend those hearings so that you can get better clarity of what happens at those events as we make decisions on our board and future decisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for District 2, we have a number of reward schools, including Cole Elementary, Creve Hall Elementary, Granbury Elementary, and Shane. But it should also be mentioned that McMurray Middle School, um, Tashaka Coverson, Dr. Tashaka Coverson, uh, and his teams deserve additional recognition for leaving the priority list. When I first joined uh, the board, they were first on that priority list. So it is quite a turn of events, and I'm exceptionally proud of all the work that's been done by his teams and, of course, those students. Um, this week has been a busy week for all of us on the board. Not only are a lot of us coming uh, accustomed to being on on the board maybe for some of our new members. But we've also had a lot of events to support the reward schools, but also we have some additional ones coming up and I had one yesterday with Coke Consolidation and their bottling company. They supported some of our schools with the All Kids Bike initiative where they provided bikes at five schools. So I appreciate Park Avenue hosting us for that. It was quite a turnout in those kindergartners, y'all. I mean, there's one thing you should know about me. It is I am talking to some kindergartners if they're there. <laughs> um, and they were so well behaved and so incredible. And I really appreciate Park Avenue hosting us. And um, it was always exciting to be at Cole for theirs as well. On Thursday, I will be at um, Tusculum's big announcement. They were chosen um, as one of the schools across the nation to celebrate Little Kids Rock. And while I am there, I'll be sure to see their librarian, uh, Caitlin Jennigan, who was recently elected to serve as the president of TASSEL, which is the Tennessee Association of School Librarians. So that's an exceptional um, 
thing for her to be. We are lucky at MMPS that we've had a number of our librarians become the president of TASSEL. And that is, to, I think, to speak to the level of um, employees that we have and their expertise and their passion for their students and for their level of commitment to the positions that they hold. It's also, as you might likely know by the most recent legislation from last year, an increasingly imp important position for us to have within MMPS, and I am grateful for their commitment to not only literacy, but our students and our state in general. Um, and then lastly, colleagues, I appreciate uh, your votes of confidence and um, it is, I am deeply touched and honored by it. I will be uh, emailing you. Please start checking your MMPS email addresses. Uh, we will be emailing you this week by Friday uh, information about committees and other things. So please be advised on that. Otherwise, we will have some future conversations about retreats. Please be aware that the first meeting of October was canceled previously, um, and so that first meeting in October, because it overlaps with fall break, will not be happening. Um, so be advised of that, and it will be changed on our schedule on our MMPS, again, at mmps.org backslash board of education maybe another backslash calendar. Um, <laughs> that information will be updated tomorrow, and so that will be all updated for everyone as well. Uh, don't forget, you can find agendas and contact information there if you have additional information you want to send to us because you are not able to stay for public participation, and I appreciate your patience with us. Other than that, be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.